All right, we're live. We're live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Joshua Elliott. I am the presenter for today, uh, and I am also the executive officer of something called the Office of Language Access in Kentucky. So my department is responsible for providing court services, uh, language access services to all of our courts in all of the entire state. So it's our official court interpreting department, you might say. Um, I'm so excited to be collaborating with New Mexico in general, and specifically with the New Mexico Translators and Interpreters Association. What a fun collaboration. I love taking things that you know seem very different and putting them together and making something beautiful. And I really think that we've done that here. Uh, so I'm super excited just to be with this fantastic group uh, to interact with so many great interpreters um, and to really do something I think that's going to be beneficial and needed in this very strange time, right? So let's talk about a few things before we get into introductions and uh, and all of the uh, all of the the thank yous that I need to say before we get started. Let's talk about a little bit of housekeeping just before we get too far into this. So do me a favor, if you haven't already done so, please mute your audio and also deactivate your camera. That will help us just keep things clear. What you should see on your screen for the most part uh, would be the presenter, myself. Uh, you should also see at least one of our ASL interpreters. So we're working with a group of uh, a couple of interpreters, right? We have two interpreters that will rotate out. The one you're seeing now, her name is Leah. And she actually, I love it that she's here because she has New Mexico ties and she has Kentucky ties. So that's why I brought her, man. She's like my foot in the door. Okay, this whole thing. We have another interpreter, Marva, who will pop up. You'll see her in just a little bit. They're gonna rotate out. And I would like it to be very um, clear. I'd like to make sure that the view stays very clear um, for everyone, especially for any of our deaf participants now, or if anyone in the future needs to view this um, so that the ASL interpretation can be easily seen. So help us with that. Uh, if by chance you forget and you pop up, please don't be offended if I deactivate you or if somebody does on our side anyway, or if we mute you. Um, sometimes people forget and there's background noise and we'll try to avoid that to the extent possible. All right. So we will talk about some more ground rules in just a moment, but I wanted to mention that up front. I'm scrolling through here to see who we have on the line um, on the uh, in the meeting and we've got such a fantastic group of people here. Uh, it's just really exciting to have Kentucky interpreters and New Mexico interpreters all in one place. What we're going to do today when we interact with each other uh, typically we will do it through the chat box. So if you don't have your chat box already opened, uh, go ahead and do that find it it's probably at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it probably says chat. There's a little icon, like a little cloud bubble icon there. It says chat. If you click on that, it'll open up. Uh, you may have to go looking for it at the top of your screen. It could be hidden a little bit. Open that up. What we want to do with the chat functionality, I'm going to monitor it while I'm presenting. Let's use the chat box only for official questions. It gets a little confusing for me when lots of stuff comes through the chat box and you know there's sort of chatter back and forth. I have a difficult time picking out um, what questions are, you know, what are real questions and what's just, hey, how you doing? So we can certainly do that up front, but once we get started, let's use that only for official questions. And occasionally I'll stop and I'll take a look at the chat box and we'll just chat a little bit. I want you to ask your questions through that chat box. When you do that, I may say, Hey, so-and-so, would you mind activating your microphone? Tell me a little more about this, right? Or would you mind uh, explaining a little bit more about your question? Yeah, go ahead and unmute yourself. I may say something like that. Mostly, we will interact through the chat box, okay? That'll be sort of our, our go-to. Again, keep that chat box clear. Keep it clean. Um, let's not use it for back and forth. Keep in mind, you can send private message to people. Uh, that's fine. Go ahead and do that. Just when we send out something to everyone, make it something related to what we're talking about, right? The topics at hand. And I'll remind you of that as we go through, no big deal. And I love it that we got so many people just from all over the place, man. I'm seeing the chat box already. A lot of you have found it, so that's good. That's a good thing. Before we get started, let me uh, thank some of the people who made this possible. First off, I wanna thank Lisa O'Grady. She has been my contact uh, with New Mexico, specifically with the New Mexico uh, Translators and Interpreters Association. And um, she has been wonderful to work with. She really, I can honestly say, was the driving force behind this. Uh, she was very patient. I'm not extremely available these days. Uh, besides my job, I have four kids and it's just hard for me sometimes to respond uh, in a timely manner. And she was so gracious and so patient and uh, really made this work. And I, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed working with her. Fantastic superstar 
Star there in uh, New Mexico doing some really cool things. So thank you so much, Lisa. Uh, I also wanna say thank you to Lisa Dignan, uh, who has been instrumental when we decided to add in the ASL component. At first, I think that our goal was to do something for spoken language interpreters, and then it expanded. We had some interest from some of our certified deaf interpreters here in Kentucky, and we decided to expand this to ASL interpreters uh, and provide ASL uh, interpretation along the way. And she was instrumental in, uh, in assisting us in not only doing that, but in getting credit uh, through RID right, the Registry for Interpreters of the Deaf, really appreciate her, uh, her efforts. Uh, she was extremely efficient, normally it doesn't happen that fast. Without her, we, we wouldn't have been able to do what we did. So thank you so much. Uh, it's funny because, you know, I, I refer to the two Lisas. I got Lisa D and Lisa O. So make sure to thank them when you see them. They've done a lot. Really good people to have there in New Mexico. Uh, really, really appreciate their work. So ladies and gentlemen, let's get started a little bit. Some introductions, I guess before we go too far. As I mentioned, my name is Joshua Elliott. Um, I've been working in court interpreting for quite a while now. It's, it's crazy. You know, I'm coming up on 14, 15 years, something like that. I told that to someone recently and they told me, yeah, you know, you're, you're mid-career now. Congratulations, you're, you're mid-career. All right, well, I guess I am, I'm mid-career. It's good to be mid-career. Um, I am from Kentucky. I currently work in Kentucky. Uh, Kentucky is my home. Uh, I don't know that I would be able to live anywhere else at this point, although I have tried. I'll tell you a little about that in a moment. Um, I have four kids, and so my oldest is 12, and then I got a nine, a seven, and a three, and the three-year-old is, um, it's chaos. He's, he's the chaos factor, so it's fun at my house. Um, I have worked for the Office of Language Access here in Kentucky for my entire career as a court interpreter. I've always been a staff interpreter. I started off as a Spanish staff interpreter, and then I became supervisor, and then I became statewide manager. And then after that, I actually left Kentucky for a little while, almost two years. I took a position with the federal courts in Miami, Florida. And so I was the supervisory staff interpreter for Miami Federal Court for the Southern District of Florida uh, for almost two years. Um, I'm federally certified and state certified. So uh, for many spoken language interpreters, Spanish interpreters, there's always this dream of, wow, what would it be like to be a staff interpreter in federal court? And so I chased that dream for a little while. I went there and did that. The work was everything you would imagine it would be. I saw some things that just, um, you just don't get anywhere else. Interpreting in a place like Miami, Miami is probably a, um, a very unique experience, I would, I would imagine. Problem was my family just really missed Kentucky. So we came back to Kentucky. I'm now the executive officer or director of our state program. I'm so fortunate that an opportunity uh, opened here for me to do that. So I'm back, here we are. And um, today we're gonna talk about ethics. So I should mention to you, you know, I love talking about ethics because I think it's something that's undervalued uh, in our profession. I think it's something also that's misunderstood. You know, we have these general interpreting canons. Um, I think, however, people take those for granted and don't really understand sometimes some of the implications of those, those canons. You know, what do they mean? I also want to recognize up front, and I think this is important, different states have different ways of interpreting interpreter ethics, okay? Uh, and that's important. The way that we do it in Kentucky is not necessarily the way that um, I did it in Miami, Florida. It's not necessarily the way that you will do it in New Mexico. Um, and so we have to recognize that up front. For our purposes today, we're going to try to keep our conversations general to the extent possible. Um, we will make reference at times to the New Mexico code or to the Kentucky code. I'm going to give you the link for that stuff. But I, I do want to make sure that we understand we're going to try to talk on a general level about interpreting ethics, specifically within the framework of remote interpreting, right? Uh, but there could be some differences. And you know, I do have some opinions on, on a couple of things that I'll share with you along the way. Uh, I'd like to point out some things that I think will be eye-opening for you. Uh, there are some general concepts that, again, I believe are misunderstood. We're going to talk a little bit about that as we go. We could talk about any one of these concepts for probably 10 hours and not get through it. Today, we have two hours, a little bit less now. And so we're going to move sort of quickly. We won't get into the weeds too much on some of these. I have lots of slides and lots of materials, more than we will get to today. So I'm going to give you the slides after the fact for you to go through yourself uh, when we finish. Okay. So there may be times when I skip a few slides, you'll see me say, hey, 
This is homework, guys. Look at this slide on your own. More than anything today, we're going to work on scenarios. We're going to do ethical conundrums and how do you solve them. And I need your participation in the chat box to do that. And at times we may, um, we may voice something. I may ask you to unmute like we talked about, OK? All right, so let's do this. You should be able to see me, our interpreter. You should be able to see as well the slideshow. Let me see on the chat box just to make sure it's working. Can everybody see my slideshow? Let me see. Just give me a quick yes or no. Okay, good. All right, and you guys got it. Hopefully you're seeing the chats come up. Keep that chat box clean, but respond whenever needed. And we're gonna do that a lot all the way through here. All right, let's do this. Don't forget also to mute your audio, deactivate your video yes. if you haven't done that. Thank you, thank you so I much. Me. How do I say? All right, and if we happen to, um, you know, unmute you or mute you and uh, to turn off your video, please don't be offended. It's just sometimes that happens and we got to go on. So let's make this happen. I think we introduced ourselves. I think we're good to go. So moving right along then. This is ethical conundrums, dilemmas, and stickity wickets. And I'm so sorry to my ASL interpreters for making you say that. Uh, this is the remote interpreting edition. So I do this presentation regarding general ethics and it's sort of the similar format. This is the remote interpreting edition made especially for today. You guys know, uh, I mean, this past year or so uh, has been crazy. It's totally changed the way that we do business, uh, that courts receive language access services. And there's really not a lot of guidance on what interpreters are supposed to do in these remote settings. So I've done my best to come up with scenarios uh, of real life things that have happened, happened to me and my staff and to some of you and our freelancers here. I've tried to take these scenarios from lots of places and we're gonna talk about them. What I wanna mention up front is that when we talk about ethics, we're really talking about a spectrum, okay? You can see my hands here. So it's not that I'm gonna give you one answer and one answer is the way that it's resolved. No, not really. We are smarter as a group than we would be individually. Uh, we have more knowledge as a group than any one of us would have. And so we're gonna work together to find appropriate solutions, but there may be more than one solution. Here's the key, okay? So maybe we have, when we talk about ethics, a conservative side, or maybe we have what we could call a liberal side. I don't know, these are political terms. I don't wanna get political, but you know what I mean, right? More flexibility and less flexibility maybe. And anything in between these two extremes, right? Anything in here, we're gonna call that ethical behavior, okay? Anything in here is okay. And you know, you may be a little more on this side and I may be a little more on this side and all that's okay. Lots of ways to do this correctly, all right? When we work outside of these ethical parameters, when we go beyond these two extremes, that's when we get into trouble. So if nothing else today, what we have to do are identify these two extremes. All of this is ethical behavior. You may have some ideas about how to do this. I'd be fine with that as long as it's in here, right? On the other side of that, however, if we get outside of those parameters, that's when we get into trouble. Keep that in mind. As a point of reference, what I can tell you is that Kentucky in general, and maybe I specifically, tend to be a bit conservative with ethics. I think it's easier to become more flexible uh, to get a little bit less conservative if you start out very formally and conservative. So typically the response you get from me will be on that conservative side of things, all right? So just putting that out there, not to say that there's only one way to do it. The rules, we sort of talked about these, we'll go through it real quick. Keep questions and comments within the scope of the discussion at hand. Raise your hand electronically and wait to be called on before speaking. You won't have to worry too much about that, but you can raise your hand if, uh, if needed. Send me the chat as well. And that's what the next one says. Please avoid vo voicing comments and questions while the training is in session, but feel free to use the chat box to communicate with the instructor through the presentation. And that's how we should do it. Just send me a chat and at times I'll stop, right? And, uh, and we'll go from there. And of course, participate and ask questions. This is a very hands-on, dynamic, interactive kind of thing, all right? Now, give me one moment here. I'm gonna make sure that we are set up uh, technologically correctly. I'm gonna make Lisa O my uh, co-host. We've got several co-hosts here, so let me just make sure that she's okay. There you go, Lisa O, you should be good. Now, let's move forward. So 
learning objectives today, gain awareness of court interpreter ethics and the role of the interpreter within the framework of remote interpreting. So we're going to look at some general concepts, and then we're going to try to apply those concepts to specific scenarios, okay? Some of the concepts are traditional court interpreting, some of them may not be. We're going to talk about some, uh, some fun things today, okay? Analyze and understand ethical duties and responsibilities when working in remote settings. There are some things that apply to these settings that won't necessarily apply in in-person court. There are just some ways that we have to do things that are unique to remote settings. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. And then we're gonna apply what we learned by participating in numerous skits and hands-on exercises. I got lots of skits. We're not gonna get through them all today. Okay, I'm gonna skip some along the way. Go back and read them on your own as we move forward, okay? Now, before we get into the skits, I think it's important for us to define a few concepts that are gonna be um, crucial for us to understand as we make our way through this presentation. First, I just wanna define remote interpreting. Um, I'm convinced that there are interpreters on this call that probably haven't done remote interpreting yet, although I think the industry is moving that way. Some of you have done it a lot um, and maybe still don't quite have a clear understanding of what it is. Other of you are old pros. Let's make sure we're on the same page so that um, we can talk about this stuff in the same way as we move through the slides. So I'm gonna give you two different definitions. This is an interesting definition that I found. Um, it's actually from academia, right? It's from the research world, uh, the academic world. This actually, this definition came about pre-COVID, okay? This was pre-pandemic. Remote interpreting, the idea of it has been around a long time, uh, but there are some subtle differences in this definition compared to what we're going to talk about in the next slide. So here we have Remote interpreting, and I may refer to it throughout as RI, you may hear that, remote interpreting, refers to the use of communication technologies, lots of different things there, to gain access to an interpreter in another room, building, town, city, or country. In this setting, a telephone line or video conference link is used to connect the interpreter to the primary participants who are together at one site. Now, that's interesting. That's sort of how it was viewed potentially before the pandemic. Not that you couldn't do it in different sites, but it was sort of understood the interpreter is one place, everybody else is in another place together, and then, you know, there's some interpretation going back and forth. Re re uh, remote interpreting by telephone is nowadays often called telephone interpreting, over the phone interpreting. Remote interpreting by video conference is often uh, times simply called remote interpreting when it refers to spoken language interpreting. In sign language, the term video remote interpreting has established itself, although now we use that for, for both sides, I would say, certainly since the pandemic. Remote interpreting is best described as a method of delivering interpreting. Uh, it has been used for simultaneous, consecutive, and dialogue interpreting. So this was from Professor uh, Sabine Braun from the University of Surrey, March 2015. So just a little while ago, right, I've given you the link here to check out her research. She has a whole paper on remote interpreting. It's interesting. Like I said, this would be the academic view of it. Let's fast forward to court interpreting view a little bit. So this was actually from the National Center of State Courts. This is more recent. I've given you the link here as well. It's a very similar definition, but there are some, uh, some differences. And I want to make sure that we have this clear uh, before we go forward. All right. I think that's going to be important. That's why I'm taking the time to read through this now. So again, remote interpreting can be defined as the provision of interpreting services using communication technology. And again, we have lots of options here in a situation where the interpreter is at, is at a location physically separate from the consumers of the interpreting service. With RI, the English speaker, the LEP speaker, and when I say LEP here, this is an important term, we're talking about limited English proficiency and I use that term to talk about uh, both uh, speakers of foreign languages and also users of sign language. Um, those are all forms and examples of having limited English proficiency. So when I use this acronym, LEP, or we talk about limited English proficiency, we are being inclusive, including everybody there, okay? The LEP speaker and the interpreter are not all physically located in the same place. Also, the consumers of RI may or may not be collocated. 
what does that mean? They may or may not be all in the same place. So you could have, just like you guys, you have users just everywhere throughout the nation even, uh, and that's fine. You see the subtle difference here that we're getting into with the, um, the definition from the National Center for State Courts. The interpreter can provide interpretation services either through the consecutive or the simultaneous mode, depending upon the RI technology being used. Uh, depending also on the setting and the interpreter's ability to use those modes. And what we've seen, of course, since 2015 is just an expansion of all of the different interpreting platforms that now provide tools to do simultaneous interpretation. In fact, take a look at this next slide. This is what I like to call a plethora of platforms. These are just the ones that I put on here. There were probably twice as many at least. These are all platforms that are commonly used for remote interpreting, most of these platforms offer a simultaneous solution. As in the interpreting world, what I've seen is that we only sort of focus on a few of these. Uh, specifically in court, a lot of times what we're using now is Zoom. You know, Zoom has the functionality to allow for simultaneous interpretation. Maybe it's not the most um, frequently, the, the most easily used, uh, user-friendly um, platform out there, but it's something that's generally used by lots of courts all over the place. And so therefore, it's sort of become a go to in many, many states. But as you see on here, there are lots and lots of different options. I've given you the links, given you the names, take a look at some of these. If you're thinking about, you know, getting a subscription to something like this, using some of these for maybe uh, private interpreting settings. Take a look, I've given you some good information here. Uh, research these a little bit. It's surprising how many are out there and many, many of them are very easy to use, work, work very well and are reasonable as well from cost. All right, let's move forward. I also wanted to find, now that we define court in, uh, remote interpreting, I wanted to find the role of the court interpreter uh, because we have individuals on here that are just getting started in this field as well. So I wanna make sure we're talking about the same thing as we go through our scenarios, okay? So the interpreter is a professional who works for the court. By the court, we can understand court system. We can understand maybe the judge. We could understand the Office of Language Access, whether it's in New Mexico or Kentucky or anywhere else, right? This person serves as a language conduit, okay? What I mean by language conduit, I wanna clarify this. I don't mean that it comes in one side and you don't think about it, you don't really restructure it, you don't make it syntactically appropriate, you just spit it out. That's not what I mean. When I say language conduit, what I mean is that there's no editorializing. The message comes in, you think about it, you process it linguistically, you think about the best way to put it into the, the um, uh, the other language, right, the foreign language, or into English as the case may be, and then you give your rendition, okay? So we have something called a source language and a target language. Source language, I'm hearing it, right? That's the original language. My target language is the language I'm going into. There's lots of processing that takes place cognitively to make those things match up. And language conduit just means you're not adding, embellishing, omitting, changing, giving opinion, right? It's coming in one side, you're doing everything you need to do linguistically to maintain, to conserve the underlying message, and you're putting it into the other language. That's gonna be important, okay? Let's see here. Court interpreters uh, provide equal footing for individuals with limited English proficiency. And really equal footing, I'm not crazy about that term, really what it is, it's an, perhaps an equal opportunity to participate because it's still not equal really. Really what you're giving them, maybe it's not even equal opportunity. You're just providing them with an opportunity, the best opportunity possible to participate as fully as possible. Because there are cultural differences we can't really overcome that we're not tasked with overcoming as court interpreters. But we're there to provide this concept of you know, equal footing, equal opportunity to participate. That's really what we want here. The interpreter, and this is important I think, strives to maintain the integrity of the judicial process so that justice can be served. That's very, very important here. So I ask people in the interpreting profession for a long time, you know, I say, well, well, what's the goal? What's your goal when you go into court? What, what is the goal of the court interpreter? Well, it's to be accurate and complete. Hmm. Uh, the goal is to be as unobtrusive as possible so that uh, the judge can talk to the LEP. Hmm. Well, the goal is to make sure that everybody in the court proceeding understands, really? No, I don't think so. I think the goal is to 
maintain the integrity of the judicial process. That means to make sure that the wheels keep turning. You are a resource through which information flows. And why do we do this? So that justice can be served. All the other things we mentioned may be important, right? I do have to be accurate and complete, but the reason why I have to be accurate and complete is because my goal is to make sure that our judicial process keeps moving along. When you understand that, you approach things differently as a court interpreter. So I really want you to think about that. Even those of you that have done this for a long, long time out there, this is very important. I want you to be accurate and complete. I do want you to be unobtrusive. I want you to interpret appropriately back and forth between the two languages. The reason why you're there though, is so our judicial process can work. Keep that in mind. That's very, very important so that justice can be served, all right? Just an example of what I mean here. If the defendant is an illiterate hermit from a geographically isolated region of a distant remote country, he or she should understand as much of the message as would an illiterate and geographically isolated resident of the United States. You're not there to make sure that they understand the proceeding. You don't know what's going on in their head, right? Whether it's remote or whether it's on site, who knows? What you're there to do, however, is to uh, give them an equal opportunity. And in the end, if they don't understand, well, there are channels that they would go through to ask for clarification. They would ask an attorney, they would ask the judge. And if they don't, do you have a responsibility to make sure they understand? No, nope. no, you don't. That's just not what we do. Not for the most part. There are some subtle differences between um, the world of American Sign Language and spoken language interpreting. There may be some things in there, arguably, that the ADA could require. You know, we change the level of the interpretation based on one's cognitive functioning. We could do that as an ASL interpreter, right? Beyond that, however, it's still an adversarial system. Keep that in mind. All right, before we go farther, let me take a look at the chat box here. We're doing okay. Um, let's see here. We got some good stuff. I'm just scrolling through. Yes, the PowerPoints uh, will be shared. The PowerPoint will be shared after this. I'm gonna give you everything for homework, by the way. Let's just see. I see some people in the Stone Age using Google Meet and a cell phone. That's okay, it works. Hey, it works. For simultaneous, you can make it work that way. It's not the most sophisticated thing, but it's okay. Um, I do have a question here. Do all RI platforms involve a cost or subscription? I didn't check when I went through all the platforms that I put on there, but my general sense is that yes, they do. Um, some are more, some are, are less, but yes, I think there's generally speaking, always a subscription. I don't know that for sure, but take a look uh, at the information that I gave out here. All right, let's go forward then. You guys know this, I'm just sort of clarifying as we get into talking about the codes. What are we talking about here? Well, rules or standards of conduct governing the members of a profession, provides members and other interested parties with guidance so you can make ethical decisions. It's the cornerstone of the profession's credibility. You guys know that, we're not little helpers. We have rules that we must abide by. You gotta do it to be a good interpreter. You may be producing very good stuff Okay, your interpretation may be very strong, but if you're not following the rules, bad things happen, especially in a system as regulated as court interpreting uh, as our judicial system in general, right? If you don't follow the rules of the game, then ultimately the game cannot continue. Something bad happens. There are adverse consequences, negative consequences. Don't let that be you. What types of codes do we use? Well, professional organizations. We could talk about NAGIT. We could talk about ATA. There may be state organizations, wherever you are, uh, that provide some guidance, sure. There may be laws and regulations relating to interpreters. Uh, there may be, for staff interpreters and contract interpreters working in court, state codes of conduct for judicial employees and contractors. There may be separate than court interpreting codes of ethics as well. Of course, for our purposes today, what we're talking about, codes of ethics from state court interpreting programs, here are links to both of the, the codes of ethics, right? The one from New Mexico, the one from Kentucky. They're very similar, really. Um, the format is different, but if you read through them, they're very, very similar. What you get in general, if you go from state to state, you find typically there is a state court interpreting code of ethics, and that usually there are very few differences between one state and another. What does vary, sometimes greatly, would be the interpretation that states have or assign to these different ethical issues that are outlined in their codes of ethics. So again, the way I do it in Kentucky may be a little different than the way you do it in New Mexico. We're gonna to try to keep things general, but I wanna point out some things too along the way, just so we're on the same page, all right? Take a look at them, this is good information. All right, 
Before we jump into our conundrums then, let's just talk about some remote interpreting tips. Okay, a lot of these were learned um, the hard way, I would say. Uh, this is not all inclusive, but these are some things I think are very important. One that's not on here that I wanna mention up front. All right, dress for success. Okay, now you can't see me from the waist down. I got my blue jeans on under here. All right, that's true. It's a truth, it's a truth of life. But from the waist up, I'm wearing my suit. Um, sometimes I find that remote interpreters get a little bit lazy and you know that the judge isn't gonna require you to turn on the camera. And so it's like a camera off kind of video uh, setting. And so you go and you can see the audio, you hear the audio and you can see all of them but they don't need to see you. And so, you know, what do we do? I come down in my pajamas. I come down with my t-shirt on. I'm guilty of it too, okay? Be careful because it's happened to my interpreters before where the judge says, hey, this is a, a camera on uh, hearing. Everybody cameras on. Go ahead, Mr. Interpreter. We just like to see you. <gasps> what? Make sure dress for success. Be ready. Be ready for the unexpected. It could happen. It's happened to me, right? How would you explain that to a judge? Sorry, judge. I I didn't uh, respect the authority of the court enough today to put on my, my suit. I apologize, you know, okay, right? So here's some other good RI tips. Make sure you have high-speed internet access. That's a given. That's tough. I imagine that's tough for some rural places in New Mexico, and it's tough for rural places here in Kentucky at times. Work on it. You've got to have that. That's the building block. Get some good gear. What do I mean by good gear? First off, you need some type of device. Uh, preferably, you would use a laptop or a desktop computer, that's probably gonna be your best outcome. It can work on a mobile device. It could work on a, a tablet. It could work on a, a phone even, I've seen it done. Can be done professionally. Make sure that you test this out though and you have something in mind. Um, you also wanna really invest in a headset. If there's one thing, you know, besides internet access that will make or break your interactions, your interpreting, uh, renditions as a remote interpreter, it's going to be your headset. And I've got a couple here that I'll show you. So the one that I have on is from Logitech. Uh, Logitech makes good stuff. This is a cheaper headset, cost me less than 50 bucks, 35, 40 bucks. I like this one because it's it has a USB chip and the USB chip, it just plugs right into my uh, my laptop and the sound quality is excellent on both sides. So you can hear me well, I can hear you very well. You'll get a really loud uh, audio if, uh, if needed. Um, this one is also wireless as you see, that's nice. I think I can go up to like 30 or 40 feet, something like that, plenty. This works very well if all I'm doing is interpreting and I use it for presentations as well. If all I need to do is talk, be heard and listen to you guys, this works very well. Now I have another headset here see if I can get this in my, my screen view here. This one is called the Jabra. And for our interpreters, that's J-A-B-R-A, -A, Jabra 65. And Jabra has a whole line of, um, of headsets that you could, you could purchase and take a look at. This one is a Bluetooth headset. This one is nice if you're interpreting and throughout the day, you may also take phone calls and you may use other devices because with this one, the Bluetooth technology, I can connect to two different devices at the same time. So I can be connected to my laptop and to my cell phone. And so I can answer calls all day in this new virtual remote world, that's important. It's harder to use the one that I have on for that because I have to take it off, pick up my phone. This other one, right, works very well for that. If I'm presenting or if I'm interpreting, a lot of times I don't use this because my cell phone could ring and I can hear it in my ears, right? Also, I'll say, I think the sound quality is a little better with the USB chip uh, than it is with Bluetooth. It's fine with Bluetooth. I think it is a little better. So if I'm doing something you know, that's long, I expect to interpret, I'll use the, the, um, the actual USB chip headphone. So just keep that in mind. I want you to research these things. It's very important. Uh, there are lots of different options, but invest in yourself a little bit. Um, buy something that, uh, that works for you, that meets your needs. Get a, a professional video background. Uh, you can use, you know, real life stuff as, as it says here, bookshelves, windows, plants, uh, curtains, or you can use a virtual background such as the one that I'm using. Uh, you can buy a green screen. I actually bought a green screen from Amazon. It was like 50 bucks or something, uh, but I actually don't even have to use that most of the time because most platforms that you use provide a virtual option that doesn't require that green screen, such as the one that I have in my background, right? Um, also, make sure that you know how to effectively use your equipment. You can buy the best stuff in the world and you have no idea how to use it. Well, that just causes more problems. So check your equipment before each session, do a test call, 
make sure your connection links work, make sure you got the right dial-in connection information, uh, learn about the selected platform. It, what I've seen here in Kentucky, uh, each judge, although we are a unified court system, each judge has his or her own preferences and they use different platforms. So on any given day, I could use Zoom, I could use Skype, I could use Microsoft Teams. Um, there may be even some other things, you know, we do telephonic, lots of different things. Make sure you know about the selected platform, ask questions, reach out, do some research online. Pay attention to on-camera context, all right? So think about what's going on, listen, make sure you're actively listening. Sometimes remote interpreters zone out because you know something's happening that doesn't necessarily pertain to you. Pay attention to what's going on. Sometimes those things affect your interpretation when it is time for you to interpret. So be alert, pay attention. And maybe most important, accept and give lots of grace. We've learned that just nothing's perfect. You may have some computer issues. They may have some computer issues. Everything may just, you know, go to hell in a handbasket, I guess. It could happen. It's happened to me. If it happens, it's okay. Give a lot of grace um, and accept grace from them too. I, I can say that our judges have been excellent to work with during this time period. They realize we're all learning. They're learning. Give lots of grace. Give grace to yourself if it doesn't work out. Maybe you're thinking, I don't know, Joshua, about remote interpreting. I, I just don't know if I want to do that. I, I'm, you know, technically, I'm not, I'm not a techie person. I can't do it. Yes, you can. You can do it. Give yourself grace and work on it. Practice a little bit. You can do it. I promise you can do it. And it's a fantastic opportunity for you to open up, uh, diversify a little bit. Give it a go. You can do this. Give yourself lots of grace. Rome wasn't built in a day. Work on it. Day after day. It gets better. It gets easier. I promise. All right? Okay. Here's what we're going to work on today then. Now that we've sort of on the same page, when we talk about ethics, there are some big topics that always come up. They are the ones you see on your screens. Obviously, we're going to talk about accuracy and how to maintain accuracy in remote settings, impartiality, um, the role of the interpreter. I've got some interesting things to say on those. We'll talk about those a little bit. Confidentiality. I've got a really good one that you're going to like, a really good conundrum. Uh, representation of qualifications, overcoming impediments to performance professional demeanor and protocol. I don't want to see anybody in any t-shirts, tell you that right now. Uh, continuing professional uh, development. So we're going to talk about all those things to some degree or another. As I mentioned, I got lots of conundrums. And so sometimes I'm going to say, okay, this is homework, guys. You do this one on your own. Go back to this one. All right. Let me take a couple of uh, questions from the chat. I'm just going to take a look over here, see what we got. Let me see if we're okay here. You know, that's interesting. So uh, Christian Ortiz says many judges in New Mexico include in our oath that we will interpret in an understandable manner. That's very interesting. We're actually going to talk a little bit about that concept, Christian, in just a little bit. You know, understandable manner. Um, what, what do we mean by this? Do, do we mean that the interpreter has a responsibility to make the message more understandable, to lower the register? There's this idea of what's called meaningful access, meaningful language access services. And the, the concept behind it is essentially that you know, the interpreter understands the concept, you listen to it, and then you put it in a way that is most understandable for the listener. And maybe that allows me to lower the register. That's pretty controversial in, in a lot of places. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. We're also gonna talk about something called summary interpretation in the remote interpreting world. We'll see how far we go. Yeah, very interesting. Um, Let's see, Amin says, is conduit, is that more for medical interpreters? No, conduit interpreting, at least as we're using it here, is for court interpreters. So as we talked about, you know, the message comes in, I don't alter the message, it goes out the other side in the other language. Um, but of course, I process it, make sure it's linguistically appropriate, all that kind of stuff. Let's see, I think we're okay here. I'm just scrolling through, make sure we're all right. Now, a lot of these are good comments. Okay, good deal. Let's move forward. So let's talk a little bit about accuracy. I'm not going to go through all of our slides on accuracy today. Uh, we have several. M most of these are going to be for you guys, but I do want to just talk a little about what it is. So most codes of ethics say something like this. Interpreters shall be accurate and complete. It's very lofty. It's a very nice goal. Um, and then usually the code of ethics will give you examples of how to do that. Why should our interpretation be accurate or complete? Well, remember, we are there to provide equal footing. If the LEP 
individual spoke English, well, they would have heard it all. And we got included all in our interpretation, right? So that's really what we're getting at here. And there's lots of components to that. We won't get into all of them today. Let's do a group exercise. So here's how it's gonna work. I'm gonna put on the screen the conundrum. You guys can read through it, I'll read it out loud. Um, and then the question is always at the end, what, if anything, do you do? And I may even rephrase that depending upon the conundrum. I may say, give me a yes or no, guys, in the chat box. You know, yes, would you do this or no? Okay, so I'll tell you how to respond after we read through it. Based on your conversation, based on your responses, we'll have a little bit of conversation uh, related to, you know, possible solutions to this. Okay, so let's give this a go. Group exercise one. Okay, here we are. And sometimes you got to pretend. If you're a sign language, you're going to pretend to be spoken. If you're spoken, sometimes you'll be sign language. Most things apply to everyone, but sometimes I do specify throughout. So this one, you are a spoken language interpreter. You are providing remote services via Microsoft Teams, okay? Which does not allow uh, easily allow for simultaneous interpretation. It could be done, but there's some extra steps. So typically we're talking consecutive. You did inform the judge and all parties at the beginning of the proceeding that you would need to interpret consecutively, but no one seems to even remember that there's an interpreter present at the moment. The judge and the attorney appear to be lost in a heated dialogue, and you are afraid that you will omit something if they don't pause soon. The defendant, whom you can see on the screen, is visibly confused. What, if anything, do you do? This is probably, you know, the interpreter's bane with remote interpreting. This happens all the time, right? Whether it's telephonic, whether it's, um, whether it's video, they're going on, they sort of forget about the interpreter. That's right. Melissa says, this is like every day. Carlos says, we got to interrupt them. So let's say we've interrupted them a couple of times and they're still doing it. Um, so let me see on the chat box, yes or no, you're in this situation. Do you interrupt the proceeding? Show me, yes or no, in the chat. Let me see what you got. Okay, I should be, you know, see about 100 yeses in here. Okay, good, good. We're all in agreement that this needs to happen. Now, let's say you've interrupted them already five times and they continue. They continue to do this and the judge is just not real interested. Do you continue to interrupt them after that? So let me see yes or no in the chat box. Go for it. Good. All right. And I actually saw Melinda said, um, and by the way, um, if you ever have a, uh, an opportunity to meet Melinda, um, she is, uh, she's there in New Mexico. She's a legend, not only in New Mexico, but in our field, talk to her. She knows a lot. She and I have worked together and uh, presented together. I learned a lot, have learned a lot from her and will continue to do so. Talk to her, please. She had an excellent um, idea. What could you do? You interrupt and they don't listen to you. What is possible here? Start interpreting, right? Everybody's talking on top of each other back and forth. The interpreter also has a voice. Start interpreting. You start interpreting by default, they're gonna pay attention to you may not necessarily stop, but they may pay attention to you. Let me ask you guys something here. In an exercise like this, they go on and on forever. And, you know, finally they stop. Okay, they stop after five minutes. Mr. Interpreter, go ahead and interpret. Can we summarize? Can we summarize? Let me see yes or no. Is summary interpretation permitted considering this new setting, considering remote interpretation? So I see some no, I see ideally no, I see to some degree, I see, I see maybe with the permission of the judge, yes, sometimes, interesting. You know, this is a concept, we're gonna put that in the parking lot for a moment, but I want you to think about this, is summary interpretation ever allowed in this setting? I don't know that it's something we can totally answer here today, but we can certainly talk about some thoughts here. And yes, Barbara, I'm talking about on the record, um, if we were interpreting and the situation were complex, as we're describing here, they're not giving you time to interpret, could we provide summary interpretation. It's a, it's a hard question. I've got a few more scenarios and then we'll get into that a little bit. All right, let's move forward. I did see someone say that maybe uh, audio is in or out uh, with what I'm speaking. A lot of times that's not on my side. It could be on your side as well. Um, as far as I can tell on my side, things are okay. Try just, adjusting settings um, also over there as well to the extent possible. We'll try our best to do, um, to do the best we can and I can adjust here on some level. All right. Let's keep going. So talk a little more about accuracy then so, since we sort of got into it. I think we're all on the same page. That was an easy one. Court interpreters are expected to convey every element of meaning. You know this. It's what we talked about before. You cannot add, omit, edit, simplify, embellish. The interpreter must not alter the register of the source message. Register, we're here, we're talking about formality. If it's formal, it should be formal. If it's um, 
If it's slang, it should sound like slang, right? Something like that. So if they say it one way and you take it to a different formality, you're changing it. If they say, sir, you are hereby remanded to the custody of the county detention center for a period of no less than 30 days. And if all of a sudden you say, well, dude, you're going to the slammer for a month. What does that mean? Did you change it? You got the right meaning, but you changed the register. That's an example of what we got. Uh, Nonverbal messages such as gestures generally should not be translated. Obviously, I'm talking about spoken language interpreters. Okay, doesn't necessarily apply to ASL. But what do I mean by this? Well, a guy flips the bird in court. All right, everybody saw it. Maybe you know that that means something different in uh, the culture of the person who actually flipped the bird. It's maybe not just a across the board kind of blanket thing that we may understand in the United States. Do you have a responsibility to interpret the gesture? There are different schools of thought on this. My typical thought is no, of course not. Uh, we typically would not do that. You're not the expert on everything that somebody can do, um, a spoken language individual can do with their hands, right? I'd wanna be very careful there. And some interpreters would disagree with that. Well, I understand. The expression of emotion needs to be conveyed with certain limitations. So there should be emotion. We're talking here about the uh, tone of the interpretation. There should be emotion in your uh, in your rendition and your interpretation, but you got to be careful because you can make it funny, right? They say something like, hey, then he came out and he had a knife in his hand and he tried to kill me. And, you know, your interpretation is, hey, and then he came out and he tried to kill me. Well, it's sort of funny. It wasn't meant to be funny. It was the worst thing ever, right? Shouldn't be, uh, shouldn't be funny. So bring it down. Then he came out he had a knife in his hand and he tried to kill me, right? Bring it down a little bit. All right, group, ep group exercise two. Let's read through it. You're providing remote consecutive interpretation. The presiding judge tends to let the party speak as long as they like without pausing for the interpreter. Um, sometimes they even digress into side conversations that have nothing to do with the issue at hand. Every so often, the judge interrupts and says something like, Madam interpreter, let me summarize that for you. Please interpret this. After which he provides a high level summary of what's been said and then you interpret that. Okay, so basically they're going on, you know, every now and then the judge stops and says, okay, let me summarize, let me synthesize that for you. Interpret this. Can you do it? What do you guys think? The judge has told you to do it. Can you do it? Let me see what you say. Yes or no? Can you do it? It's their court. Whenever the judge says do it, you must do it. Yes, okay. Listen to the judge, just do it. All right, good. Okay, we're sort of in agreement here. Oh, I do see a no in there, can't do it. So let's talk about this. I mean, we're talking about summary interpretation. This is a little different because I, as the interpreter, am not making that um, I'm not making that decision alone, right? Uh, the judge is making the decision. Now, this makes me a little uncomfortable still, because regardless of what the judge said, you know, there's a requirement. Court interpreters have a requirement to be accurate, uh, complete. We understand all of that. Perhaps, perhaps, what you would do is put on the record what your obligations are, and then do whatever the judge says. I agree with that. I agree that we have to ultimately follow the judge's lead on this. At the beginning, preferably at the beginning, if possible, these are things that maybe I would establish with the judge, especially if I know that this judge likes to do that, right? So maybe I would say, Your Honor, uh, before we get started, um, can we talk a little bit about the interpretation? Uh, how would the, the court like the interpreter to provide services today? It'll need to be consecutive judge, so I would need pauses, but what would the best way be for the court? You perhaps might say that. Uh, maybe if the judge talks about summary interpretation, oh, I'll, I'll let you know what to interpret. I'll, I'll summarize it. Uh, yes, Your Honor, that's no problem. Uh, you know, ethically, we are required to do to interpret everything on the record, but uh, as long as the court is comfortable with this, I'm comfortable doing it as well, Your Honor, that would be fine. Something like that would be fine. I always encourage interpreters to get this on the record to make sure that you protect yourselves from a challenge after the fact. I want it to be very clear that this is the judge, judge's decision and not the interpreter's decision. I wanna make sure that you're not picking and choosing what's important, right? That the judge has made that determination. And it's very clear that that's how we will proceed. Sometimes you don't have that option to speak up front. Um, if it becomes clear along the way that that's the judge's preference, that they're gonna stop. Well, the first time or the second time, I would then do it uh, on the record, I'd let the judge know. Uh, Your Honor, uh, before we continue, uh, Your Honor, the interpreter is required to interpret everything uh, to maintain the accuracy of the record from an ethical perspective. I can provide summary interpretation. I just wanna make sure it's on the record that you're comfortable with that, Your Honor. Yeah, sure, absolutely, right? 
So make sure. Now, here's a good question. So Reka says, she's my good buddy, says, would the judge be annoyed if you reminded them of the oath? Uh, not necessarily. Frankly, a lot of judges are not aware of the oath. I want you to worry less in this case about annoying the judge and more about ensuring accuracy, ensuring uh, integrity of the process, ensuring completeness, making sure also that you're protected. I wouldn't want there to be a challenge and the interpreter to get caught in the middle of the challenge. I want it to be very clear that this is the judge's choice and that it was a knowing choice, right? So summary interpretation, maybe in this case, can work. I don't want you to make that decision. So let's make sure on the record that the judge has made that decision and that everybody understands what's going to happen and that you did raise a concern, right? Do it respectfully. It just has to happen. So we have a couple of comments here. I always check the environment of the court judges and lawyers. Yeah, that's exactly what we're talking about. This should, in remote interpreting, this is just part of your daily protocol as you go in. You know judges, you get to know them. You may not have to do this every time, but if you don't, make sure that you clarify up front. Remember how we told, we talked about paying attention to context. Well, the context up front, if you're waiting for your case, can give you a lot of information about how you will proceed as well. Maybe it's not necessary to inter uh, interrupt the proceeding, but do take care of yourself. Don't be afraid to get something on the record that protects yourself. And you are an officer of the court. It's important that your voice be heard in this situation, right? Good deal. Let's move forward a little bit. We're not going to go through these next few slides too much. I want to get to more conundrums, but these are just other examples about how we keep, uh, maintain accuracy and completeness. You know, register we talked about, word choice. There may be lots of right options, but there's a best option depending upon the context. Pay attention to context. Obscenities, just part of the job. Some of you might tell me, hey, Joshua, that's the best part of the job. I don't know what you're thinking out there. It's a crazy world in Kentucky, New Mexico. All right, but you got to say them. You know that. Uh, idioms, culturally bound terms, you know, sushi is sushi. A burrito is a burrito. You don't have to, you know, interpret that. You maintain those things. Same with, uh, with conversions, meters, gallons, inches, pounds. We don't convert. If they say the guy is 1.85 tall, we say he's 1.85 tall. You know, somebody may look at us crazy in court. They're like, what, was he a little bitty dude? He's like this tall. No, you know what I'm talking about. They'll work it out, okay? Let it work itself out. All right, just a couple of other things here. We're not gonna to talk too much about it. You know, convoluted, nonsensical things, filler words, make sure they're in there. Even on your remote interpreting when doing consecutive, um, things like, um, well, I mean, on Spanish, we might say, este, bueno, pues, em, right? Got to know those in both languages, forms of address. These are important things. Make sure that you're including those things in your interpretation. Really here, our challenge is to, to convert meaning, not necessarily to think about words, right? So I'm relaying meaning from one side to the other, not focus so much on words. Look up the word after the fact if you mess up the word, don't get me wrong, right? But really what I'm interested in is that underlying meaning, maintaining that concept, that unit of meaning from one language to the other. If you do that, you win. If you don't have the right word, you should be able to do something called circumlocution, circle, locute means speak, you speak your way around it, you sign your way around it maybe, right? Those things are important. Here's some example how we interpret meaning. We're not gonna go through them. This is a, a, um, a homework assignment, go back. These are all idioms. Make sure you understand what these idioms mean. If you don't look them up, please. Examples of register, high to low, shall we depart? Would you like to leave? Should we go? Wanna take off? What do you say we blow this popsicle stand? I love that one. One of my professors told me that one. I've always kept it in here. I don't know who talks like that. If you came up to me and be like, hey man, want to blow this popsicle stand? I don't know what I would do, but it's fun. You guys see the point here. Register, we're saying the same thing here with different words, okay? All right, group exercise three, let's do this. You just finished a long remote hearing. Although most of the participants have disconnected, both the judge and the LEP defendant are still visible on your screen. Apparently upset with the outcome of the hearing, the LEP says very loudly in the foreign language, they may sign it as well in the foreign language, same shit all the time. Although the hearing is over, no one ever mentioned that court has been adjourned. The judge is busy reviewing paperwork and doesn't seem to be paying attention. What, if anything, do you do? Mr. Carlos says, render, baby. Huh. I see some say nothing and shut up. I see some nada, bye bye. Let me see. We're about half and half, you know, and some of you say interpret it, say it, some of you say don't. Let me give you some context behind this. So I'm taking these all from real life, okay? This happened. 
to our wonderful operations manager that we have here that I work with closely. Her name is Aymara, she's wonderful. And uh, she was interpreting in Spanish, she's a Spanish interpreter. This actually happened to her. The guy said in Spanish, you know, he said exactly this, same shit all the time, right? The hearing was over, a couple of people have disconnected, but she was there. And so she interpreted it. She said, same shit all the time. And her concern was that when she said it, because the guy disappeared right after that, right? When she said it, she was concerned that the judge thought that it was, it was she who had actually said that, that she wasn't interpreting, but rather those were her words. And so she, you know, she emails me after the fact, she's like, Joshua, I just want to make, in case you get a complaint, this is what happened. It wasn't me. I wasn't saying same shit with this judge all the time, right? She just wanted to make sure. The judge actually didn't react one way or the other. The judge was busy doing something. I don't know if the judge didn't hear it or just didn't care. Um, probably the judge did know, in fact, that it was just an interpretation. But the question still remains, do you interpret it or not? There's a spectrum here. I don't think any of these are wrong. What would I do? I would interpret it. I would say it. Um, yeah, I would say it out loud. If the judge had a question, I would, uh, I would clarify that I was interpreting, that I'm still interpreting, but I would say it. I wouldn't have any issue interpreting it. Um, if it was something that was heard, that was audible, we're still on the line, I haven't disconnected, I'm there. It's part of a proceeding. An English speaker would have heard it. Okay. You know, there's a question of, did it really end or not? Is it over or not? If I heard it in English, I would interpret it. That's how I would go. I think it's easier to err on the side of caution here and say it than leave it out and potentially um, have a challenge for not having interpreted, I think, right? It could go either way here. Do you interpret it? I would do it. I would go ahead and do that. That would be my, my recommendation here, all right? So let's talk a little bit about the next one. And let me make sure here before we go forward, I'm just scrolling through. I'm keeping an eye on my chat box as they come up. I think we're okay. Let's see here. Even if you've been dismissed and you're about to disconnect, Sandra says, it, it, it's, it's a judgment call there. Would I, I think I would. I believe that I would. Uh, most judges, I would think, this judge was busy. Most judges would probably look at you and probably expect an interpretation there. You know, I think that I would. You wouldn't be wrong in not doing it. You could connect and, hey, you didn't hear it, whatever, okay? I, I see that argument too. I would. I would interpret it, okay? All right, let's talk about impartiality now. <laughs> Esther says more, more exciting that way it is there are gonna be some fireworks if the judge picks up on that Esther you know that okay interpreters shall maintain an impartial attitude with attorneys witnesses defendants and relatives interpreters shall be unbiased and shall refrain from conduct that may give any appearance of bias they shall disclose to the appropriate authority any real or perceived conflict of interest hmm okay Easy enough, you know, you sort of do what you do. You don't have interaction with all the other parties. Seems easy enough. Well, let's get into this a little bit. I think, I think this is an area where lots of interpreters struggle unknowingly even. So let's talk about it. All right, group exercise number four. You are providing remote interpreting services during a bench trial. I'm not sure, I assume this terminology is used in New Mexico. This is when uh, the judge, there's no jury, right? The judge is there um, and the judge is, um, is, is the one that will ultimately decide. All participants, including the LEP, are participating remotely. Everybody's remote, okay? While interpreting simultaneously, so you're using one of these fancy simultaneous remote interpreting platforms, you realize that someone has sent you a private message using the chat function, just like you guys are right now to me. So I'm doing my thing, but chats are popping up. And out of the corner of my eye, I see it. Upon closer inspection, you see that the LEP is using the chat function to ask you questions about what is being said in court right? This is a foreign language speaker. Um, if, it's, um, if it's spoken language, you know, they're, speak, they're writing to you in the foreign language and they're asking you, what does that mean? What, what should I do about this? Tell them this, right? So what, if anything, do you do? Number one, let me see yes or no. Do you respond? Do you respond? No, we can multitask. I could, I could type back to you guys while I'm doing this. I could do it. Let me see. Everybody says no. I'm waiting for somebody to say yeah. I know somebody out there is like, yeah, yeah, I would talk to him. You're not going to put it up there, but I know you're thinking it. Okay. We're on the same page. You don't respond. Okay. Okay. So what do you do with the information then? Um, let's see. What, what are my options? Give me some options over here. So I see you ask the judge to instruct. Yeah, I know where you're going with this. Um, inform the court. Inform the judge. Advise the judge that the party is uh, texting you, whatever. Yeah, I think that's, that's going to be the appropriate solution. Remember, we're talking about impartiality here. Um, the problem here is that maybe it's going to your private uh, personal chat 
It's not the group chat. So the attorneys and the judge don't see this. It's just you. You have some interaction here that could be problematic if anyone were to find out. Remember, we have to play by the rules of the game. There shouldn't be any private interaction here, but yet this person's opened the door. We do need the court's assistance here. What does that look like? Well, how do we say that? Lots of different options. Um, I would say something like, Your Honor, Your Honor, let's get his attention, right? Your Honor, forgive the interpreter. Maybe I'm going back to the English channel as well. Don't forget that because you're toggling maybe back and forth between Spanish and English, right? Foreign language and English, I should say. Not everything's Spanish. All right. Go back to English. Your Honor, forgive the interpreter. Your Honor, um, the defendant is sending the interpreter uh, private messages, their questions relating to the proceeding, sending them to the interpreter in Spanish. Uh, how would the court like to proceed? Or could the court inform the defendant not to talk to the interpreter? Lots of different things you could say there, but I would go down that path for sure. Interpreters are many times afraid to interact with the judge. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Reach out. You have, you have a problem that only the judge can overcome. Make it known on the record. Now, if the judge tells you, don't interrupt me again, I don't care. Okay. Well, I tried. I got it on the record. That's fine. I'll do what you say. That could lead to procedural consequences later, right? An attorney picks up on that. There's an issue behind the scenes. Could there be challenges in the future? Yes, but you tried. And don't take it personally if the judge doesn't necessarily uh, take his interest in what you're saying. Uh, but follow up. It's your obligation to follow up. This can be seen as an impediment that you must overcome. You have to follow up, right? All right, let's see here. Let's go back. I'm just looking through. Yeah, yeah, you guys are on the right track here. Politely seek the court's indulgence. Yeah, very nice. Very nicely done. Okay, let's go forward then. Let's do another one of these. These are fun. I think we're we're bonding now. I feel good about this. Okay, you are covering remote interpreting, uh, remote arraignment court. So we have like a jail docket or something and you're connected. Let's say you're doing video interpreting. The only case on the docket today is that of the LEP who is in custody for domestic violence. You are connected to the meeting and can see the LEP who is joining from the jail on your screen. Could be spoken language, could be sign language, okay? Before the hearing begins, the defendant quickly asks you in the foreign language to please call his mother who is very ill and is probably suffering because she doesn't know where in the world he is. He further explains that the phones at the jail don't work. He then actually gives you the phone number there. He either signs it to you or he says it out loud. So I want you to call mama. Mama doesn't know where I am. Okay, hasn't started yet. The, the video was active, the audio was active. He could actually say it, you did hear it. You have this information. Judge isn't even really paying attention. What do we do? Number one, can we call mama? Let me see, yes or no? Let me see what you guys got. I better not have anybody calling mama. I know I love mama, but let's see. Nobody's calling mama, inform the judge, okay. Good deal. Yeah, we're okay. This is pretty clear. Should be pretty clear. Just making sure. Your heart goes out to this person. Maybe he's telling the truth. Maybe not. Maybe that number he gave you is not mama at all, right? Maybe that's somebody else, but okay. So we got all that. Let's see here. So you guys are on it. I see where you're going with this. So um, in the end, what do we do? We inform the judge, right? If it were real life and, and there was this type of question, perhaps there would be a little interaction forgive me, sir, I can't speak with you. I'm just the interpreter. We'll tell the judge when the judge comes in. I could do that virtually. I could. Want to be careful here not to open up the perception of a conflict by us chatting. So as soon as this person opens the door, telling the judge, getting it out loud, even just interpreting at that point, right? The audio is active, we assume. The person just said it out loud. I could just interpret it. I could just say, can you please call my mom? Call my mom. Uh, the, the phones here at the jail don't work. Her number is 555-5555. I could say that. Let it play itself out. What you don't do is interact. You don't engage, at least not out without some previous um, interaction with the judge. So I think we got it. All right. And I love what Minu says here. Let the judge know and decide. Anytime you have these decisions, that's, that really sums up ethics all in all. You have these decisions. Most of the time, let the judge decide. If it's something that's, you know, you've got on your chest, you're like, I don't know, should I or should I not? It's not clear cut maybe from our ethical conversation. Let the judge decide, of course. Yeah, and just if you just interpret, right, like Raquel says, you're going to get to the right place, I think. All right, let's keep talking about impartiality for a second. The interpreter may not express, show, or even appear to show partiality for or against a party in a case. If an interpreter has emotions, beliefs, or opinions that are so strong that they may affect his or her performance, 
the interpreter should ask to be excused. Conflicts of interest, real or perceived, must be avoided. Um, I've never had to ask to be excused, but there are some things in my mind that potentially could, could lead there. Um, I've never had to do that. There are some things that bother me more than other things. I can tell you one thing that really bothered me. Uh, I was in Miami. I was a supervisory staff interpreter there, as you know. In federal court, one crime that we deal with a lot is child pornography. Um, and I got pulled into the worst, the worst case you can imagine, uh, unfathomable things. Uh, and I had to prepare for the case. I didn't, I didn't remove myself. I sort of wish that I had because you can't unsee some of the, you can't un unthink, unread some of the things that, that you go through. I was fine doing it. It's fine. I don't mind doing it. But in this case, would that be an example? Potentially. It's okay. Don't be afraid to do that. It's okay. You live to fight another day. Preferably do it before you go to court. Talk to Joshua. Talk to whoever's on the New Mexico side about it. Talk to the supervisor. Preferably, you know, before court. But if you get in a situation, it's better to withdraw and fight another day than to have bad things happen because we didn't follow this ethical rule. Okay, so be careful there. Um, let's do another group exercise, shall we? Here we go. You're covering remote arraignment court. Um, Do we do that one? I went backwards. Hold on. I don't want to go that backwards. Let me go forward. Hold on. We're not quite ready for another one. I confuse myself. These are examples of uh, impartiality. Okay. Personal opinions must maintain your neutrality. Conflicts of interest shouldn't be any in there. You shouldn't care about the outcome, right? You shouldn't have any um, concern about the out outcome. You shouldn't be rooting one way or the other. You know, if, if this happens, something good will happen for me. Shouldn't be that way. Interactions with parties in the case, uh, interesting. We're gonna talk about that one and role conflicts. I wanna spend a little time talking about it, okay? Um, because I think that this is misunderstood. We're gonna go through a couple of group exercises and we're gonna see if we can get to the, the heart of this. So let's do a group exercise, now we're ready. You're interpreting remotely for a defense witness who happens to be an accountant. He's testifying about tax documents, which are foundational in determining the defendant's financial solvency and legal business operations. Since you have interpreted for this defendant and his attorney outside of court, you are sure that the documents presented as exhibits are fictitious. So apparently what is happening, you're uh, interpreting remotely. There's some witness testimony here. You are the court interpreter that day, but apparently you were also hired by the attorney uh, outside of court to prepare the case. And so you've had a little bit of interaction on this case outside of court, and then you get to court as the, the official court interpreter. All right, so let's go. Let's see what we got here. How many of you say, uh, number one, let's talk about the issue at hand, just in terms of you realizing that there is a lie, a lie in testimony, how many of you would inform the court of the lie, yes or no? Let me just see yes or no. Good, okay, I think we're all on the same page. You would not tell the lie, okay. Now, I guess the question for me here is how did you know it was a lie? How are you so sure? Is it just the fact that he's lying through his teeth and anybody can know? That's not really what it says here. What it says here is that you had some previous knowledge because of case preparation outside of court, and then you were hired as the court interpreter as well. And so there are these two conflicting roles that you've played. And because of that, you have some knowledge that maybe you normally wouldn't have had. Interesting here. I saw a, a comment earlier that said, you know, we need the parties uh, of the names of the parties, the case information before going to court. I would hope so. I would hope that they would give you that. Even if they did though, and I, and I find that this is a what I feel is, is something that's misperceived and something that's not just not understood very well. Let's say that, you know, you've helped the attorney outside and then they tell you, hey, for the same case, can you be our trial interpreter for the case? Many interpreters would tell me there's no conflict here. Of course I can do it. I'm impartial. I'm impartial there and I'm impartial here. It's all one same thing, right? It, I'm impartial. Not necessarily. I'd want to be very careful. I'd want to tread very cautiously here. Hold on to that for a moment. Let's talk about a couple things and come back to that, okay? And, and really, that's right. What we're talking about here, just like Edie says, is there a conflict of interest? Um, I think there is. I think there's a very serious conflict of interest here. I don't think interpreters can play more than one role on any given case, although that is the practice in many places. So I want to talk a little bit on a general level about perhaps how we should carry this out. And really what we're talking about here, let's take a look at this next slide. We're talking about two different roles. And there are, there are other roles as well, 
right? But these are the two main roles that I define when I talk about ethics. It's really important. So that's why I brought it up into this conversation. This is remote or you know, in-person, it's gonna be the same. I think in remote, these lines are blurred a little bit more easily because you're sort of just connected to everybody, right? Doesn't seem real maybe, but they're still very important. So on one side, we have what I call the sworn proceedings interpreter, right? Um, and really, you can think of that as the court interpreter, the in-court interpreter, whether it's remote or in person. This person is an officer of the court hired by the court or the judge or the county, however it works, wherever you are, to provide impartial services for the proceeding itself. OK, there's that person. And then there's what I call the private linguistic expert. This has other names as well. Right. Table interpreter, the check interpreter, because they're checking, um, you know, they're checking the interpretation of the sworn proceedings interpreter, maybe. Uh, you might hear this called the party interpreter because they're assigned to one party or the other, they're working for one party, the defense or prosecution interpreter, right? I call that the private linguistic expert. This is when you were hired by the defense to help with the defense along the way, to help pre preparation of the case, okay? And um, you're being paid specifically by that person. You are still impartial, but you're a member of the defense team providing expert services outside of court. The difficulty that we get into is when these two things crisscross, right? Sometimes you're the sworn proceedings interpreter, and sometimes you're the private linguistic expert on the same case. You should do both of these types of work. Sometimes you should be the sworn proceedings interpreter. Sometimes you should work with attorneys and do case preparation. I love that work. I do that work too. However, you can't do it on the same case. That's something I think that's generally misunderstood, um, not only by interpreters, but by courts. And I think expectations are there for us to break these roles when really they shouldn't be. So what role do you play? Here's that sworn proceedings interpreter we talked about. You're under oath, officer of the court. Think of yourself maybe as more of an extension of the bench. If anything, your ethics would line up more closely to the judge's ethics. The judge is an impartial entity, right? You should also be an impartial entity. Um, if anything, you know, you think, well, I work for the defense. I'm interpreting for the defendant. No, you're not interpreting for the defendant or for the prosecution. If anything, you're interpreting for the bench, for the court. Okay, the judge, maybe you could consider it that way. And because of that, you're impartial. You have to remember the work we do as a sworn proceedings interpreter. They have what are called evidentiary considerations. Uh, those interpreters are bound by the rules of evidence. And this is something people don't understand. And I think remote interpreting opens up the possibility of really blurring these lines dangerously. You have to remember that in a court setting, everyone has a role to play and everyone has specific rules. Everyone, the judge, the defense attorney, the prosecutor, uh, the interpreter, right? Everyone, every, all the parties, there are specific rules regarding the interactions you could have, the things you can and can't do, the interpreter's work is bound by those rules. They're called the rules of evidence. Nowhere in the judicial system, nowhere does it, does it exist. Does the concept exist of a person who can float among all parties and maintain their impartiality and still perform that same function in court? Doesn't exist. Doesn't exist in state court, doesn't exist in federal court. That's, that's not a thing. You could not use the same expert as the court's expert and then as the expert for one of the parties fingerprint expert. The court hires a fingerprint expert to give consultation to the court. Well, that person could not possibly turn around and be paid by the defense to provide justification to the defense for their argument as well. Couldn't possibly happen. Can't happen in court uh, interpreting either. Can't happen. Just not a thing. Interpreters don't realize this because we're used in all these different capacities. Can't happen. Shouldn't happen, right? So as you perform these functions, think very clearly about the role that you're playing, you can't jump roll. Once you're in a role for a case, I typically say that's it. Maybe you could jump roll once, but definitely that's it. If I were the court interpreter once and I interpreted court and then an attorney hired me after the fact, maybe I can jump roll once, but I couldn't go back to court after that. Maybe I could do that. I don't even like that idea, but maybe I could do it. If you are an interpreter of a language that is hard to find uh, and there's only exactly one of you in that area, right? Okay. Well, you should disclose. You should disclose your concerns to the judge and the attorneys and have all of them waive what's called uh, conflict, waive conflict, right? Okay, that could happen, right? If everybody understands that I'm going to prepare the case with the defendant and the defense outside of court and I'm going to come to court because I'm the only interpreter and there's no other option and we're all okay with it, okay. 
but most of the time that shouldn't happen. Shouldn't happen generally with Spanish interpreters, with ASL interpreters, right? Um, other languages perhaps, but when there's a plethora of interpreters of that language, we should not, okay? Let's talk a little bit about officer of the court. Who are officers of the court? Well, we have judges, attorneys, clerks, bailiffs or sheriffs, and we have sworn proceedings interpreters, okay? That's you, you're an officer of the court. And what that means is that you're charged with upholding the law, administering the judicial system, uh, making sure that the rules are followed and that you yourself must follow all of those judicial rules, okay? Very, very important. I'm looking at the comments here. Looks like we have some good um, clarifications and comments. I think we're getting this. Uh, very good to, uh, to clarify this on the outset at the beginning, make sure that all parties know that what your role is. We feel uncomfortable as interpreters saying, no, I can't do that. Telling a judge, judge, I can't do it. Just make them aware of your ethical obligations. If they order you to do something against those, I'm not saying don't do it. We do what the judge orders, we know that, but it's okay to let them know what your ethical obligations are. In Kentucky, we had that, that fight. Um, the culture was that we would interpret for everybody everywhere. Bad things procedurally started to happen in some of those cases. And so we got a new Supreme Court order that was approved by our Supreme Court um, that said that we couldn't do it. And we won that fight. It's a difficult fight to win, but we won that fight. And we have a very delineated role or set of roles for the interpreters um, in, in our courts in Kentucky, right? Uh, so it can be done but it takes strength, it takes support from the top, and it takes you being willing to talk about what your ethical limitations are. You can't just do everything, bad things happen, okay? Yeah, and so Melissa asked, how did you go about that? Did you address the Supreme Court? Yeah, so I had to write what are called our administrative procedures. We already had some, I rewrote them. It was a huge revamp and I had to present to the Supreme Court. So I went in person to our Supreme Court and presented to all of our justices and I had to get their approval and it was fantastic. It was one of the best days of my life. I loved it, man. But our Supreme Court is awesome. So it was a lot of fun. Um, that's what it would take, right? It can be done. And we have some very specific guidance now that says you can't do this. But even if the guidance isn't there explicitly, you can't do it. And that's true at federal and it's true at state level as well. You really can't do it. Federal rules also do not contemplate case preparation outside of court. Keep that in mind. All right. Group exercise number seven. Let's do this. You are providing remote simultaneous interpretation. The judge and all English speaking parties are using the English channel. So we have the two channels when we do simultaneous interpretation, okay, if it's set up correctly. So we have an English and then we have the foreign language channel. The LEP is connected to the foreign language channel in this scenario and you are toggling back and forth. The judge needs to ask the LEP a few questions. And so you go into consecutive mode here and you begin switching from English into foreign language. You're going back and forth, okay? While listening to the LEP's responses, so you're listening to now how he's responding, you realize that you hear another person speaking the LEP's language in the background, and um, that person is instructing the LEP how to answer. So you can hear it. Nobody else hears it because you're the only one that's on the, the LEP's line, right? Everybody else is English, and they only hear your English when you toggle over to English. So you hear somebody in the background. First off, is it okay? What do you do? How many of you say, you know, you do nothing? Let me see, yes or no? Uh, do you tell the judge, hold on, let me go back. Let me, let, me, let me do that better. Do you tell somebody that this is happening? Yes or no? Do you tell, yes or no? Let me see. So I see yeses, advise the court. I interpret everything. Okay, we see some yeses here. Okay, good deal. So we have this thing happening in the background. As far as you know, it's not an attorney. Maybe it's the wife or the husband or whatever the case may be, there's something. Do we tell? Yeah, I think you do tell. I think again, the perception of a conflict here, um, I think we have an obligation here to make this clear to the court. Don't take it upon yourself just to swallow this and not tell. Maybe it's no big deal. Maybe the judge doesn't care. Probably what would happen here and in real life when this happened, what the judge did say, um, the judge said something like, sir, you need to answer your own questions. No one else should be speaking in the background to which the LAP responded, oh, I'm sorry, judge. I'm sorry, right? and then whoever it was stopped. But it was important for the interpreter to make that known. Um, another option here that I saw in our chat box was, well, just interpret everything. I'm not opposed to that. Perhaps it could add some confusion depending upon what they're saying and what you're hearing. It could be very confusing here. It, it might not be um, 
easily discernible that that's what's happening in the background. I wouldn't mind stepping out of role a second. I would do it in the third party. Uh, Your Honor, uh, forgive the interpreter. Uh, the interpreter is hearing two voices in the background and is not sure who to interpret for. Uh, would the court uh, be able to inquire? But what do you mean? Well, there are two voices in the background. When you're responding, I hear two voices there. Could the, the court inquire with the LEP? We'd leave it on the judge that way. You know what's happening, but leave it to the judge to inquire what's going on uh, to give that uh, instruction, something like that. You know, unknown, all right, Norman says, unknown female voice says, I love that. You could do that. Unknown male voice says, don't answer that. Don't answer that. You could do that. We could say that. You guys don't understand what we're going here. I do think that there is a, there is an obligation for us to take some action here. And I think what you guys are saying uh, would make it sense. Let's see here. The judge would hear it directly and ask questions. Yeah, in that case, you could, right? You know, you sort of let it roll itself out. That actually brings us to another point. One of our group exercises is um, uh, it actually relates to saying things like that, you know, female voice, male voice, Mr. Elliot, the judge says, we're going to talk about that if that can be done in remote interpreting in a few minutes. So hold that thought as well. You guys are on the right track here. All right, let's move forward. Let's do another one. I think we're having fun. All right, you've been assigned to cover Judge Taylor's morning remote traffic court docket. Okay, we're talking traffic tickets, DUIs, you know, speeding, no insurance, that kind of stuff. There are several LEP cases on for court arraignment today, so you anticipate being quite busy. A defense attorney representing one of the LEP defendants has apparently never spoken with his client before today, so he asked the judge if he could be placed in a separate breakout room for a few minutes with the LEP and the interpreter to go over the facts of the case and prepare for the hearing. Right, so he, he gets there, he's like, judge, I haven't had an interpreter. Can I use the interpreter to go over the case? The judge who just learned how to use Zoom's breakout room functionality seems all too happy to oblige. I wanna try this new button out. Sure, I'll put you over there. Okay, so I would like to see from the group, can you do it? Can you go and interpret this type of scenario or not? Let me see, let me see what you say. Okay, inform the judge, very common in jails. I got that order all the time. Why the fuss? Okay, tell the judge we can't do it. Interesting. Yes, yes, I can. Yes, if the judge orders it. Ask the judge if she would like you to do it. Okay, if the judge orders, yes. And says, I have to comply. Okay, interesting. Now let's talk about this a little bit. So remember our previous conversation on breaking role. Okay, so there really shouldn't be a scenario in which our sworn proceedings interpreter helps an attorney prepare for a case. By preparing for a case, what we can understand here is practicing law using judicial resources outside of the presence of the judge, outside of the presence of the court. I'm just using court resources and I'm doing what I should have done before I got to court. This attorney didn't follow up, didn't, didn't get an interpreter. Maybe it was uh, of no fault of that attorney, probably not, probably just didn't do what they should have done right? Attorney is too cheap to pay. That's right, Esther. I like Esther, man. She's got some good stuff. Too cheap to pay. That's probably what happened, right? There shouldn't be a scenario in which our interpreter gets caught. And so I bring this up here because I know that this is, a, this is something that happens a lot in all places. And I know that this is a, uh, a difficult situation to resolve. So let me describe how I think that this should probably go. And I realize fully, like I said at the beginning, different states do different things. Um, and I'm okay with that still doesn't mean necessarily that it's ethical. So I wanna talk about the ethics behind this a little bit, right? So in those administrative procedures that I mentioned earlier today, um, in those administrative procedures, we have outlined that interpreters can't do this. They exactly can't do this. Now, like many of you said, if the judge orders me to do it, I'll do it. Um, it doesn't mean that that judge's order supersedes the Supreme Court order that I have that says I can't, but out of respect, uh, for the judge, we typically do do this, although really they don't have the authority to order us to do it. But in this case, if you found yourself in this situation, what I would say before the judge presses the button and sends you off into cyberspace with this attorney, all right, into the breakout room, I would say, Your Honor, forgive the interpreter. Your Honor, the interpreter will do whatever the court orders. Uh, however, uh, I did want to make the court aware the Supreme Court has told interpreters not to, to do this. I actually ethically am not allowed to interpret uh, to help prepare cases outside of the presence of the court with the attorney. I may even say something like, uh, actually getting an interpreter before court is just a part of effective counsel, uh, effective communication. Technically, we're not allowed to participate. It would be breaking my ethics. How would the court like to proceed? 
I would say something like that. If the judge orders you to do it, okay. Okay, judge, I'll do it. What our code of ethics says is that if the judge orders you to do it, you do it, and then you follow up. You follow up with our office, you follow up with me, or you follow up with our operations manager who I talked about before, and we will address it with the judge. Judge doesn't really have the authority to do that, but typically we'll do that to try and respect the judge in the courtroom, right? Shouldn't be happening though, bad things can happen. Um, to add to this, what if you know it's a domestic violence case, you went with the defendant, and then the prosecution's there and they say, hey, we have a victim. Can I use the interpreter for the victim? So you did, you know, the thing with the defendant and then you go to the victim and you hear all the stuff and, you know, you're hearing both sides of this and you're thinking These, somebody's lying here, right? One side or the other. And then you go back to court and you're supposed to be impartial. But I got all this stuff flying in my head about what's going on, right? So, you know, actually, Melinda makes a good point here. Federal guidelines allow for interpreters to interpret attorney-client communication that is incidental to the hearing. This is important, incidental. It does not contemplate case preparation, but it is incidental. So we're talking about short procedural conversations, five minutes or eight minutes, something like that, incidental. And in fact, we can, we can do that as well. So in Kentucky, for example, um, I can interpret logistical administrative things. I'm not saying we can never interact. If it's the court's business, I can get it done. I feel like that's probably um, as well, the, the spirit of what's written on the federal level as well. If it's the court's business, we can help. Logistical, administrative, if we need to relay a plea, you know, an offer for a plea, uh, we can certainly do that. If we need to go over some forms, if the, we need to talk about what's about to happen, we can do that. You know, logistical, administrative stuff. Can't help you prepare your case, though. That's just a part of you doing that. Be strong on this. Be very strong on this. Um, the interpreter does have to know the interpreter's role here. So be careful with this. This gets interpreters into lots of trouble because, because you are really not a part, not really, of what's called privileged communication. We're taught that we are. It's a lie. It's a vicious lie, right? Depends on the state a little bit and how your laws are written, but more than likely, um, you are not a part of privileged communication that takes place between an attorney and a client. Good. I'm getting some responses here. What? What do you mean? You have to remember there's a difference between privilege and confidentiality, okay? Privilege is something that always rests with the client, with the defendant. Um, confidentiality is something that you control. You are obligated to keep things confidential. But are you included in the privilege between the attorney and the interpreter? We could talk about this for hours. I love this concept, but I'm just gonna say it just one time, okay? Just a little bit. The problem is they're taking the court's resource interpreter. You work for the court. You're impartial. They take the court's resource. They inject that resource, that interpreter, into a privileged communication setting. There's no expectation of privacy. No expectation of privacy at all, right? Not to say that you would turn around and tell. You're not going to do that because you maintain it confidential. The problem is because they use the court's resource, is it possible for opposing counsel to force you to tell what was said? Is it possible? Yes, it's happened in many, many places across the United States. Remember what I told you, the, the work of the interpreter is governed by the rules of evidence. If we're not careful and we break this important rule, bad things happen. What do I mean by that? Maybe they can get to the information that you just heard. Obviously you wouldn't wanna do that, but would you be forced to disclose legally? Potentially you could be. Depends, there may be some laws in place in one state or another to protect the interpreter in this role, but really the interpreter shouldn't be there anyway. That's not really the whole point of, of interacting on this level, right? That, that should be done before court, should be done with case preparation. You're telling me an attorney comes to court and they have never talked to their client? What? I mean, what would happen if I went to court and you know had never learned Spanish? <laughs> I mean, it's not going to go very well for me. They don't have the basic tools. Same thing here. Be very careful. We're not going to talk too much about this um, because I know that this is a um, something that we could spend lots of time on, but I want to make you aware. So let's go back here. Yeah, Melissa says that scenario is total common in New Mexico. It's totally common in Kentucky. I want to make it clear. We have taken steps to protect the integrity of the process by not allowing our interpreters to do this. We've changed that culture. It's a hard change. Just because it's common someplace doesn't mean that it should be happening. So just be very careful here, okay? You have to navigate these waters carefully. And I'm not telling you in New Mexico that you should say, I'm never doing this again. I'm not saying that, but I want you to be aware. That's what this presentation is about. Be aware of these issues. Be aware of general interpreting ethics and really these roles, these roles that interpreters play. Be very careful and be aware, okay? I'm just really pointing this out and making it aware. We're not going to change everything that happens in one place or another today, but interpreters need to know these types of things, okay? 
and it was a rough job, Dave. Let's see. I'm going to go back just a teeny little bit, guys. Let me make sure that I'm catching everything. There's a lot of stuff coming through here. If I don't catch something here, um, we will stop in a little while at the end, and I'm going to answer all kinds of questions at the end. We'll stay a few extra minutes. So I'm sort of just looking through here. You know, I've got some good comments. Okay, I think we're okay with this right now. We will address some other questions a little bit later. Forgive me if I didn't quite get to your stuff because there's a lot of good stuff coming through. All right, that's okay. All right, let's move forward then. We're rocking and rolling. Sworn proceedings interpreter, I'm going to let you guys read through this. This is how we define that concept, how I define it, okay, here in Kentucky. Difference between a sworn proceedings interpreter and the private linguistic expert. You're gonna read through this on your own, all right? Here's the other slide for private linguistic expert hired by the defense. Now you're the person who can do this type of stuff outside of court. You should be doing this stuff. You're not under oath. You're not the sworn proceedings interpreter. So it, you're working in a capacity that doesn't require that oath. In this capacity, you're not an officer of the court, just as any expert testifying on behalf of one side or the other would not be an officer of the court. What you're there to do is provide constitutional access to counsel, you can interpret privileged and or private communication. In fact, you're included in attorney client privilege because you were hired to do so. Absolutely, you are in this case. And maybe you monitor the sworn proceedings interpreter. This is something that ASL interpreters do very well. Um, spoken language interpreters have learned this on the fly in recent years. This wasn't really a thing in spoken language interpreting, but now, for example, it's very common in Kentucky to go into court for a trial. I'm assigned to the trial, I'm there to interpret, and defense has brought their own interpreter uh, who also listens to my interpretation and consults with the attorney to potentially raise objections to my interpretation, right? That's the only way that those things can be safeguarded for the record later. Could it, ha could it happen? Yeah, absolutely. Could we be challenged? Yeah, and we should be. And so we've improved the quality of interpretation that way as well. There's checks and balances. So it's not just the, the sworn proceedings interpreter's word per se, right? It's not just that you say that and that's law. No, there's somebody there now to assist the attorney in making those objections. What I wouldn't want to see as a side note is an interpreter, you know, the the, the the private linguistic expert objecting for the record. Objection, your honor. I object because that's not what was said. No, let the attorney do the objections. I've seen interpreters do that in our court. We've learned, okay? Don't do that. But having said that, they should be consulting with the attorney on these things. All right, I'm gonna let you guys read the next slides. This is also the definition of that private linguistic expert. You know how we sort of define it. Take a look at it. It's important stuff. Let's do another group exercise here. Okay, so give me a second here. I'm gonna expand my little box because I'm getting all kinds of good goodies in there. Let's see, okay. So an individual for whom you have been interpreting is very grateful for your assistance in court. At the end of the remote hearing, he or she sends you a private message and offers you a generous tip to thank you for your services. He also, or she also asks you for your phone number in case anything else comes up. What do you do? Can you give this person a number? Can you take the tip? Let me see, yes or no? I know some of you are thinking, well, but is he cute? Well, what does she look like? No, 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 don't do that to me. No, you can't do it. All right. All right. So, yeah, we can't do this. You guys know we can't do it. I had a buddy. This comes from a real thing. I had a buddy who did this. Um, he actually got the person's number, and they dated after court, after he interpreted for this lady. Don't do that. Just bad mojo. We can't do that. You know what? perception of a conflict of interest. Absolutely. I probably, I think in this case, and we saw it up on the chat, I wouldn't respond. Um, I wouldn't respond directly um, at all. I would, I would be finished. I would disconnect. Hopefully they would disconnect and that would be the end of it. Okay. So can't do that. All right. Let's keep going here. Let's see. Melissa says the problem is that we were being asked to use our private phone number to call the LAP. Sometimes they already have it. A difficult situation. It's not it, remote interpreting sometimes is not ideal in that not everybody has, you know, the right thing and you know you got your phone number and they're using different stuff and yeah I can see where that could be a problem I would take steps to try not to to give them let them have access to that but sometimes it's unavoidable Melissa and I understand it you know one thing that you could do is block that number um, if you can see their number you know inversely if you can see their number uh, you could potentially block the number and not have to deal with it but yeah you'd want to be careful here all right let's move forward so possible conflicts of interest. Just a few things. This is not an exhaustive list by any means of the, any stretch of the imagination. Defendant is your friend. You have an interest in the outcome of the proceeding. You have interpreted 
for the defense or for the prosecution in their preparation for this case. We talked about that. Don't do it. It's bad mojo. Defendant gives you a gift, politely reject it, unless it's a million dollars, then take it and run. But otherwise, you can't take it, okay? You hate the attorney so much or he makes you so mad that you can't interpret impartially. I don't know what he did to you, okay? But you shouldn't be in that situation if that's the case. Uh, defendant is accused of a crime of which you were once a victim. Maybe, not, not always, right? Not necessarily mandatory that you withdraw, but maybe if you have very strong feelings and cannot maintain your impartiality. The defendant is facing the death penalty and you are very much against the death penalty. Again, maybe if this causes an issue with maintaining impartiality, maybe, right? You would want to be very careful here. Um, so just uh, some examples. Think about this. You're human. Uh, you have emotions that are involved. And if those make it too difficult for you to maintain impartiality, you probably shouldn't be there. For me, this typically will happen with things that uh, deal with children. You know, I, I have four little kids, as I mentioned earlier, um, child abuse cases, child pornography cases, ugly things, hard, hard for me to interpret, but I can do it. And I do do it. I was interpreting a trial one time. Uh, the guy was, um, he was accused of raping his girlfriend's seven-year-old little girl. The seven-year-old little girl was uh, severely disabled. She was bedridden, uh, cognitively didn't have much going on. You know, her mother would put little lights in front of her eyes and her eyes would light up. That's, that's about the extent of the interaction. And the mother left and left him there with her and he raped her. And, and I was interpreting this, this was in Indiana. And um, I could just feel myself getting angry. Just, I think probably my face was probably red as I was reading through this and preparing for the case and, you know, hearing the testimony, but I was able to take a step back, push it out and do my job and let justice be served. And I did the job the best that I could. I was fine. If I were going to withdraw, it would be something like that. Know yourself, know your limitations. It's okay. Preferably do it before you go to court. We talked about it. All right. Good deal. Let's talk about scope of practice. Interpreters shall limit themselves to interpreting or translating. They shall not give legal advice give counsel, express personal opinions to individuals for whom they are interpreter. You shall not engage in any activity that may be construed to constitute a service other than interpreting or translating while serving as an interpreter or translator. You got one job and it's hard. It's really hard. You're there to say what they say, no more, no less. And that in and of itself is challenging. People work lifetimes on getting that right do that job. If someone else is paid to do another job, they should be doing it. Don't do their job for them. All right, let's look at a group exercise. Ready? You're providing video remote consecutive interpretation in a family court hearing with numerous participants. Although some of the participants are using both audio and video, others have joined with audio only. Although everyone has done a pretty decent job of giving you time to interpret, you realize that it's not always clear to the LEP who is actually speaking. In fact, you are noticing that the LEP is not fully follow, following the proceeding due to his or her inability to distinguish who the speaker is. So there's a lot going on here. It's not even clear for you sometimes who's asking the question. You're just interpreting out loud. Do you have any obligation in clarifying this? Let me see yes or no. Is there an interpreter obligation here to clarify who is speaking, yes or no? So I see some yeses, some no. Inform the court. Not my job. I like Rosemary, my good buddy. You're strong. All right. To a point, okay, Carlos has taken the diplomatic approach. To a point, maybe, all right. In this new medium, yes, thank you, Melinda, that's excellent. No ethically, maybe, <laughs> I love it, okay, good, all right. So is there an obligation? You know, what I have come to learn, sort of just recently, there have been several of these that have popped up for me. It may not be necessarily my responsibility, maybe, debatable. Maybe it's not my responsibility, but it is my problem, okay? may not necessarily fall on the interpreter. We talked before about doing one thing and that's interpreting and translating. Maybe within the role of interpreter, maybe this doesn't fall on me per se. It's probably not outlined anywhere. You know, thou shall make sure that the LEP understands who's speaking. Maybe not, but in this new medium, potentially I have a role and it is certainly my problem, okay? Because it also affects me and at times maybe I'm not even clear who's interpreting. So can, can we clarify this? Would it be okay, for example? You know, we have several people speaking, and if I'm simultaneously interpreting, it's not even consecutive, if I'm simultaneously interpreting, and I just say, you know, okay, now the judge says, 
and then I simul. Okay, now Mr. Elliott says, now the defense attorney says, okay, from the defense attorney, from the witness, from the judge, is it okay up front as we're making these transitions from speaker to speaker, can I say who is doing what, right? I don't have any problem with that. Uh, here in Kentucky, you know, we've talked a lot with our freelancers and our staff. We understand that these things have come up. Uh, I have no problem authorizing my interpreters to provide a bit of directional clarification at the beginning of this. We're not explaining anything. Uh, we're not going above and beyond to advocate. Uh, we're not providing cultural information. We're just providing a bit of clarification along the way to make things flow a little bit better. That's fine. Usually happens in consecutive, right? Um, and it usually happens from English into the foreign language, although it could be the other way around. Uh, sometimes I might say, uh, judge from Mr. Lopez, uh, your honor from the LEP. And then we go forward because even when I speak, honestly, frankly, when I speak and voice things into English, at times it's not clear to the judge or the other parties who I even am, right? It may not be apparent at the beginning. So is it okay for you to do these types of things? I have no problem with this. I can't find an ethical reason not to. I think Melinda said it very well. In this medium, is it okay? Yeah, I, I wouldn't have any issue with this, with a, a clarification to point out. Now, it's a double-edged sword because what could happen on the other side if I do? Let's take another look at a, another group exercise, okay? To provide clarity for the LEP during consecutive remote interpretation, you have decided to identify who is speaking each time you interpret into the foreign language. So you're doing this and you're doing it by saying or signing the name of the speaker, just like we talked about. Mr. Elliott says, uh, from the judge, from the LEP, you're sort of providing this clarity. One of the attorney picks up on your strategy, right? He hears you doing this as you're interpreting for the LEP. And he says, hey, I hear my name. I know you're talking about me. I'm trying to be humorous, but he says it out loud. The LEP is now very confused and the judge is looking at you expectantly as if waiting for an explanation. All right, so you tried your best to clarify, but you got yourself in some hot water because you sort of did something that they weren't expecting. And now the attorney's being a little facetious and funny. What do we do here? So let's take a look. How many of you, how, how would we address this? How many of you address it with the judge? Yes or no? What do we do? Yep, I think so. I think that's the only thing. I think at this point we stop. If you didn't previously let the judge know, remember sometimes it's better up front to sort of establish how we're gonna interpret. Are we gonna provide some clarity in this way up front? right? We provide a little bit of clarity up front on how we're going to go about doing remote interpreting. And then it's easier because what's happened, we didn't do that here. You took it upon yourself to do it. And then somebody noticed and they sort of called you out on it a little bit. But if I got caught doing this at this case, and I say caught, not that you're doing anything wrong. If it was questioned, I would just say, uh, your honor, uh, forgive the interpreter. Yes, the interpreter is just clarifying, uh, providing some directional clarification for the LEP at the beginning, who is speaking. It's not always apparent who is speaking. I would say something like that. And I would leave it at that. Probably the judge will say, you know, I wish somebody would do that for me sometimes. I appreciate it. Thank you. I think we're okay here. And then I would interpret it that back into the language of the LEP as well. All right. Let me take a look at some of our um, some of our notes here. Looks like we're okay. You know, Carlos, I just made up that term directional clarification. That's just off the top of Joshua Elliott's head right here. A lot of Joshua Elliott humor in that one. All right. We're good to go. So yeah, I think I would say that just providing directional clarification and maybe what Melinda said as well, based on the medium, based on the fact that we are uh, providing remote services, I was providing directional clarification. Eh, why not? Okay, good deal. Yeah, and Roberto says there's a need to identify speakers when LEP is audio only. A lot of times this does happen when we're really dealing just with audio. Sometimes it's a little easier to catch when they're video, although that can be hard too. But when it's all audio, it can be very confusing for the interpreter as well, by the way. All right. Let's see. Let's keep going. So adhering to the role, that means generally there's no cultural expertise. There's no clarifications. Don't give legal advice. Even if you are an attorney on this call, and I know some of you may be, not in this, not in this situation, you're not. All right, you're not the attorney on record. Hard for attorneys to leave things out, leave things behind, but you're not an attorney when you're interpreting. Uh, advocating, can't do it. Explaining, clerical work. Don't take somebody's stuff and drop it off for them someplace. Don't do it. Be human, but if somebody's getting paid to do one of these things, they should be doing it. All right, group exercise, let's go. You are assigned to cover Judge McGillicuddy's afternoon DUI duck docket. I love Judge McGillicuddy, he's a good guy. 
Each case must be conferenced with the prosecutor before going in front of the judge. The, judge, uh, the judge's secretary places you and the LEP in a breakout room to speak with the prosecutor, but the prosecutor hasn't arrived yet. This would be a scenario in which I would be fine interpreting. Uh, you're not going to go practice law. The prosecutor has to make the offer. There may be some forms to fill out. This is fine. I have no issue with this. The problem is they dropped you in this conference room, this breakout room with just the LEP and no one else is there yet. Prosecutor hasn't gotten there yet. Um, you're there alone with the LEP. After a few minutes, the LEP asked you, well, what do you think I should do? Should I plead guilty or should I get a lawyer? So we have a few different issues. We're alone with the LEP. We're potentially talking with the LEP, and now they're asking for legal device. Number one, can you tell this guy if they get a, uh, if he can get a lawyer? Can you tell him? Can you give him some direction? Okay. All right. I think we're clear here, okay? Some of you have said, just mute. Mute yourself, mute him, turn off your camera. That probably should have happened, right, up front. The reason why this is in there so that we can just talk about this, prepare you for the eventuality of being in this situation alone with an LEP, you should act as though you're not there, right? I don't mind saying something up front like, you know, sir, um, we're gonna wait for the prosecutor. I've been told the prosecutor's on the way, please wait. I don't mind that. I don't think we have to go into the whole thing about it. You know, I can't speak with you for these reasons. I probably wouldn't say that. I'd just say, prosecutor's on his way. Please wait. I'm muting my line now. And I would disconnect, you know, my camera, mute the line. That would be fine, right? I think that's fine. When the prosecutor pops on, you pop back up, and then you're back in business. Be aware that being alone, okay, with the LEP in this scenario is like being alone in person with the LEP. Generally shouldn't happen. If it does happen, take steps to distance yourself to the extent possible. In this case, that means muting, right? Maybe a brief explanation and then cut it off, shouldn't be. If a question is asked, if, I, if you sort of got to me before I did that, I might say something like, we'll address that with the prosecutor. One moment, please. No, I would say we can ask that to the prosecutor. I might do that, but that would be it. Careful of the perception of a conflict. In remote interpreting, even though it seems that you're alone, perhaps you don't fully know who's listening. You don't know who is on his side listening in the background. You don't really know who has access to what it is um, that you're saying. Just be careful. We mentioned this here so that you take steps to safeguard your interactions there, okay? Uh, Melinda says you can also leave the breakout room until the prosecutor arrives, potentially. What I found with that, Melissa is, uh, Melinda, forgive me. What I found with that is that um, it's sometimes hard to get back in, right? The way that it's set up in Kentucky, we have like an administrator that's, that's dropping people off for the judge. And so you go in and they put you in the right place. Sometimes they give me control to leave and put myself back in, and sometimes I don't have that control, and so they have to put me back in, so yeah, keep that in mind. All right, let's go forward here. Group exercise 13, you log in nice and early for your morning remote assignment. You're there on time, before on time. As, you, as soon as you connect, a deputy clerk greets you, uh, greets you by saying, hot dog, thank goodness you're here. The LEP is having all kinds of trouble with his audio. Can you walk him through it and make sure he's ready to go, you know, that he turns everything on? The judge will be on the bench shortly. Thank you very much, honey pie. And then the clerk proceeds to disconnect, leaving you to assist the LEP with his technical dilemmas. Same kind of thing here. You're alone now. Is it your job to assist them in getting connected? Is it your job to know how to connect? And when you get there, to be able to advise LEPs? Let me see here. Rekha says, goodness, no. No, we're not going to do that. Now, um, as a matter of practice, I can tell you, we have a person in Kentucky that is a staff interpreter for us. Each of our staff interpreters manages a certain area. And in Kentucky, I have a person who manages our technical stuff, you know, all of our technical initiatives. That person helps with this type of thing with LEPs, but she is typically not there assigned as the interpreter. She's there, she is an interpreter, but she's there to help the court get connected with LEPs and vice versa. That's different from me assigning you as an interpreter and you being responsible. Speak up for yourself, you can't do this. Someone else should be able to do this. The court has IT people. Um, now, as a language access program, maybe we translate instructions for people into different languages for them to be able to 
know how to connect. We have done that in many languages here in Kentucky. That's fine, right? There's no problem with that. Um, but it shouldn't be upon the interpreter to know how to do this and to guide them and to you know take the initiative to do it. Uh, of course, right? You have to be very careful here. And I do agree with this, right? You, if if we are not careful, we can make everyone's job a little bit more difficult. If we're not careful, we can really mess things up technically and make it not work at all. Probably don't take that upon yourself. There's no obligation for you to do that here, although I know interpreters are being asked to, okay? So just to review, when you are interpreting, and I did see the note here that we have some uh, federally certified interpreters that are also public defenders, and that's fantastic. But when you're doing just one thing, interpreting, you are not an attorney, nor are you an advocate, a buddy or a confidant, a gopher, a parental figure, a cop, a judge, a secretary, a psychologist, a problem solver, you're none of those things. You have one job and it's a hard job. You are an interpreter and maybe an occasional translator, right? I'll throw that in there just for fun. You're not any of these things, stick to your role. Your role is important, right? All right, let's move forward here. You're not a cultural broker either. I didn't put that one up there, but you're not that either. Confidentiality. Oh, I want to talk about this one. Good. We're right on time. We're doing great on time. I appreciate you guys hanging in there with me. So interpreters shall protect the confidentiality of all privileged and other confidential information obtained during the course of their official work. Confidentiality is with us. Okay. Um, that means that I have an obligation ethically to just keep quiet about it. Maybe they can force me to say it later. Right. That's privilege. That's different. But anything that I hear I'm just going to treat it as confidential. As a, a general practical matter, treat everything as confidential. You'll never get into trouble. Just don't talk about it. You know, with colleagues, you can mention things on a general level, but keep it all confidential. The next thing I'm about to share to you really happened, mostly. All right, here we go. Let's go through it. Group exercise 14. You are interpreting a juvenile proceeding from home. Your spouse is quarantined in the upstairs bedroom because they got COVID. And so you're also in charge of making sure your two kids connect to their virtual classes on time and complete their schoolwork. So you got the kids, you got your spouse in quarantine and you're interpreting a juvenile proceeding. As you're interpreting, your nine-year-old walks up behind you and taps you on the shoulder to ask you a question about an assignment. The judge, seeing your child in the background, immediately interrupts the proceeding to ask what is going on. She's quite upset since all juvenile matters are strictly confidential. Before you can respond to the court, the nine-year-old points to your screen and says, hey, it's Jimmy from my class. Hmm, yeah, so let's talk about this. This happened, it wasn't quite this dramatic. They didn't say Jimmy from my class, but there was a juvenile proceeding. We had an interpreter interpreting. That interpreter had an intern with her on that day and the intern's out of the screen and then at some point comes into the screen Right. And the judge is like, who is this? And so I got a phone call and um, an email from the judge saying, what happened? So how do we resolve it? There's no real good resolution for this. I put this here to make you aware of the need to consider confidentiality issues as you interpret remotely. Practically speaking, what would you do here? You would fall on the mercy of the court and beg for forgiveness. That's what you would do here. Don't let this happen. The best thing to do here is to not let this happen. OK. Um, because this is a real mess. This is a mess to get out of. Yeah, and I agree. Um, you would beg for forgiveness, Your Honor. You would talk about quarantine and my husband and virtual, and this is horrible, Judge, and please forget. You know, okay. We're not going to do that here because you're prepared now to avoid this because you realize that when you are interpreting in juvenile court or any other confidential setting, you must treat your workspace, your remote workspace, as the courtroom and take steps to keep other people away from that confidential setting. OK, anybody who could be behind you that could listen, anybody that could see um, the contents of your screen, you will make sure that your virtual workspace is set up in such a way as to protect the integrity of the court. OK, this is difficult, Alex. Uh, would be hard for me. I got four little kids. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm interpreting, they're right here beside me because I'm the tech guy in my house. And so they're doing their stuff. And occasionally, you know, I help them. Not in juvenile court, though. Be very careful here. We mentioned this here. I, I put this here to raise awareness. We, we have gotten to a point with this conundrum, with this situation where there's no resolution. We are really at a dead end and we messed up bad. Don't let this happen to you. Take steps to ensure the integrity of the process and the confidentiality of the proceeding by 
just ensuring nobody else was around. Okay, that's why I put this here. This was real, it sort of happened. The judge was very nice about it. It was just an intern in, in our case that happened here. And so because of that, um, it was fine, right? She understood and it wasn't a big deal. If your son comes up and says, there's little Jimmy from my class on there, man, we got a problem. Okay, don't let it happen. Okay, we're gonna go past confidentiality. Uh, just the next couple of slides here, because we talked about it. I sort of uh, got ahead of the game a few slides ago, and we talked a lot about that kind of stuff. It, of course, applies. Privilege may apply, depending on, on the role that you're playing. Keep that in mind, of course. Okay. Let's see here. Group exercise number 15. You recently provided remote interpreting services for a complex evidentiary hearing in a murder case. The hearing was not confidential, and the video of the hearing is of public record and can be requested at the local clerk's office. A few weeks after the hearing, a newspaper reporter who has viewed the video reaches out to you to ask you a couple of questions. The reporter, who happens to also speak the LEP's language, seems particularly interested in your interpretation of certain terms during the proceeding. What, if anything, do you do? Can you talk to her? Let's see. I know some of you are thinking, yeah. I've been on news before because I was interpreting. I didn't give a, uh, a statement, but you know, in the background, you see them, they took a picture, right? And I'm back there interpreting. Can you talk to them? Never, let's see, no. Okay, looks like we're good. Okay, call the court, maybe. I mean, I think the easiest thing to say is no comment, no comment. You could cite your ethics. Uh, I apologize, uh, my ethics do not allow me to speak with the press, no comment something like that. Don't take the call. You can't do this. You guys know you can't do it. In person, it seems easier to avoid. You walk away, you know, you can sort of put a, a physical barrier barrier there. Now they have the recording of you. They've seen you interpret. They, they've either seen you do the signing or they've heard your interpretation on the video itself. They want to ask questions. Maybe they want to challenge your interpretation. Who knows what they want? No comment. There's no win for you by speaking with this person about this. No comment. You guys know that. I think we're okay here, okay here with representation of qualifications. You know, are you certified? Yeah, I'm certified. CPR, I'm certified in CPR. No, you know what they're talking about. You gotta tell them that you know you're certified or not if they ask you. If they do this in a remote setting, try to keep things short and sweet. It shouldn't be a, you know, a 10 minute dissertation about uh, all the things that you've ever done in court interpreting and your degrees and stuff. No, we know that, all right? Keep it short, keep it sweet. Your Honor, I am certified by New Mexico. I'm certified by Kentucky Court of Justice to interpret in judicial proceedings. I hold both state and federal certification. Boom, all right, we're good, you know that. They don't wanna know about your certification as a CPR instructor, okay? Let's see here. Assessing and reporting impediments. You shall assess at all times your ability to deliver services. Um, when you have any reservation about that ability, then you shall immediately convey that reservation to the appropriate judicial authority. Let's do one more group exercise. We're gonna finish up for the day, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. You're providing remote simultaneous interpretation from home for a complex hearing using Zoom's language interpretation feature. Everyone but you is present in the courtroom. Although the judge and the LEP party are connected to Zoom via individual devices, the attorneys are simply speaking into the court's microphones. You can barely hear those attorneys because those microphones are not integrated into Zoom, although you can hear the other parties just fine because they're connected. You've already stopped the proceeding a couple of times to ask for clarification and then uh, and can tell that the judge and attorneys are becoming frustrated. What do you do? There's an impediment here. Do you continue to interrupt the judge? Yes or no? Let me see it. Do you have an obligation? Let's see. I'm just making sure we're all on the same page here. Yeah, absolutely. Unfortunately, the environment, the medium that we're using to interpret um, lends itself to auto, audio issues at times. And because of that, you may have to interrupt. I understand that the judges and the attorneys are getting frustrated, but remember, they're really not frustrated with you. They're really frustrated with the situation. They're really frustrated at the fact that they've got to use remote interpreting services, uh, that everything has to be done uh, remotely, that they can't be on site. They're frustrated about the pandemic and everything else that goes with it, as are we, we get it. But it's not your fault and you have a job to do. So yes, I would do that. And I would just make it very clear 
in this interruption, and I would probably do it sooner rather than later. Your Honor, forgive the interpreter. Um, the interpreter is having a very difficult time hearing counsel. Uh, I believe that it would be difficult to continue in this way. Uh, I just can't guarantee, the interpreter cannot guarantee the accuracy of the interpretation in these circumstances. Are, is there another solution, Your Honor? The interpreter just doesn't feel that he can appropriately interpret this way. Let them know, let them know up front, get it on the record, protect yourself and the the integrity of the proceeding by by doing that. And if you have, if the judge says, hey, we're going to go forward. OK, we'll interrupt again if needed. Um, or if you don't interrupt again, make sure that it's clear up front that you had these concerns uh, and just simply cannot guarantee the accuracy of your interpretation. OK, so be very, very careful, uh, very, very careful with this. Um, and maybe like you said, Lisa Hunter, the judge may get annoyed enough to make a change, absolutely. In Kentucky, it's not that we can't go on site, it's that everything has to be done remotely if possible. But if we got in this situation and the judge realizes that we just couldn't do it, we can make an exception and go on site. In the next couple of months, we'll start going on site even more. We're transitioning back that way. Um, but I wouldn't be opposed to providing an on-site interpreter. It has to come through my office. I've got to give approval for that to happen, but I wouldn't mind doing it. There are some courts that we've worked with that it just can't work. It just can't work remotely for many, many reasons, right? So that's okay. All right, let's do this, ladies and gentlemen. There are a few more exercises in here. Um, 17, I believe it's through 20 that I have. I'm gonna have you guys go through those on your own, okay? We've covered most of these things indirectly throughout our proceeding. I'm putting them on the screen now, flipping through, just to make sure that um, you guys can see them for the video later. So feel free to stop the video as I flip through these. Stop the video, look at these along the way, and, um, and go through these on your own. Using the knowledge that we've talked about, the knowledge that uh, we've sort of gained through this, I want you to make a good decision now, realizing that there is no one answer. You know, there's sort of this gray area here. There are lots of answers in there. I want you to go back through that. Let's finish up a little bit with a couple of slides here. Bear with me a couple of minutes. So who gets hurt when interpreter ethics are not observed? Well, the LEP's individual due process rights are violated, right? Even in remote settings, that LEP has a right to due process, of course. The legal system fails, right? Because justice is not served. We talked about that a little bit. Um, who else? English speaking defendants, because really they're not getting the benefit of an unethical interpreter who's explaining things to them along the way. Our colleagues lose credibility because maybe you did something you weren't supposed to do and then a colleague goes in and the judge says, hey, but so-and-so did this for me, why can't you, right? Your colleagues are affected greatly. Generally speaking, we as interpreters, when we become responsible for the outcome of the proceedings, we as interpreters and the interpreting profession, when you take matters into your own hand and you don't follow that, that ethical guideline, okay? So brief pop quiz here. I'm gonna let you guys go through this on your own. We talked about most of these things along the way. Remember this closing thoughts, all interpreters make mistakes, but good interpreters address them and they learn from them. And that's what virtual remote interpreting is, okay? Ultimately, it's just a learning experience. If you've made mistakes or if you're even not even sure you wanna interpret anymore because you're uncomfortable with remote interpreting, give it a go, it's okay. You'll make mistakes and you'll figure it out. It's not impossible. An old guy like me from Kentucky couldn't do it if it were impossible. Give it a go, just give yourself lots of grace like we talked about. All interpreters have limitations. Good interpreters know them and they consistently work to overcome them. Virtual slash remote interpreting can be a limitation. Your lack of knowledge overcome it. It's okay. You pass the certification exam. You interpret in court. You can do this. You can conquer the laptop. Do it, all right? All interpreters need a little help sometimes. Good interpreters will ask for it. If you need help with remote interpreting stuff, ask for help, all right? Reach out to your language access office. Reach out to some instructor. Reach out to a colleague. Get help. It's not that hard. You can do this. I want to encourage you to do it because I feel like our profession is trending in this way. I don't think this will go away. We will do more on-site stuff, of course, as the pandemic is controlled, but this is here to stay. Give it a try. All interpreters learn constantly, but good interpreters work to apply what they've learned. Take the knowledge that we talked about today and put it into practice wherever you are, whatever you're interpreting. A few resources for you guys. I came up with a few things. You talk about guidelines and guidance and suggestions and tips. These are some good places to start. Uh, I found quite a few things. Some state interpreting programs have some really good uh, documentation posted. Uh, other national organizations have some things to look at. Take a look at this. There's some spoken language and some, uh, some ASL stuff on there as well. 
ladies and gentlemen, that is what I've got. Thank you guys so much for, for being here, for giving this opportunity for our groups, for our states to collaborate. Uh, I feel very, very fortunate to have had this opportunity. Um, please reach out to me. What I'm gonna do after this presentation, uh, I will send the slides. In fact, uh, the, the Lisa's, my, my, um, my dream team there, they've already got this, okay? So I'm gonna have, I'm gonna ask Lisa O to distribute this to all the participants. They've already got the presentation. Uh, I'm also gonna ask her to give my contact information, give my email, feel free to reach out to me with questions that we didn't get to. Um, also guys, I'm gonna hang out here for a few minutes if there are other questions, let's go back now. Just take a couple of minutes, I'm happy to chat a little bit. You can unmute yourself. Let me turn this back over to Lisa O. The, the myth, the legend. Thank you so much, my friend, for having me. It's a pleasure to, to have been able to work with you on this. Likewise, Josh. And we are so incredibly fortunate um, that you agreed to take this on. As you mentioned, there hasn't been a lot out there in terms of this. And so I feel like we've broken some ground and hopefully we're providing um, all of our colleagues with a really great opportunity to learn what to do when these situations come up. Um, very quickly, um, there have been a few questions in terms of what is necessary for the RID um, information and also um, about certificates uh, for those who need uh, CEUs. So I will be sending in the chat um, right now um, links. There are two links. Hopefully you all have seen, you see them and I can send them again. Um, but the first one is for those of you who need the RID um, credit. So there's a form that you will fill out. You'll put your name, your address, um, as well as your number, your registration number. And I will forward that to Lisa Dignan and she will manage the um, RID certificates. There's also a survey on here. And um, I know some of you have mentioned throughout the, the chat that there are other areas that you would like to have trainings on. And so um, please take some time at the end uh, to fill out the survey. It'll give us all some ideas. Um, those of you who are members of NMTIA, I think you know that we really do try to serve our members and to get you the training that you need. So the only way that we know what you need is if you let us know. So if you could please take some time to um, to fill that out, that would be great. And um, also again, for the um, ASL interpreters and the CDI interpreters, if you can, um, if you need your credits, please make sure you fill out that form and I will get it to um, Lisa Dignan. Um, as far as certificates for the CEUs, uh, we will be sending those out after the meeting. Um, they're automatically generated from the registration. Um, so if you don't get those in the next day or two, please reach out to us and we can resend it. Um, I think that's all I have, but I would like to, um, on behalf of NMTIA, I would like to thank you, Josh. It was an excellent thank presentation. You. Um, and I hope that this is really maybe just the first of a long uh, working collaborative relationship with the Kentucky courts. So thank you again very much. It was really an amazing presentation. Thank you, my friend, for having me. And a question for you, uh, Lisa, regarding membership in MT, uh, NMTIA. Uh, do you have to be in New Mexico to be a member? Could Kentucky interpreters become members as well to stay up to date? Yes, of course. Um, we have, um, it's been one of the um, goals of NMTIA to make sure that our membership is affordable. It's $40 per year. And uh, we do provide trainings throughout the year, especially in this time of COVID when um, training resources, um, I know that a lot of our members took a big financial hit when um, COVID hit. Um, and this is one of the things that I so appreciate um, you sharing with us about what you've done for Kentucky. For example, one of the reasons why we're recording this is that Kentucky interpreters can get credit for uh, for our CEU credits by watching the video. And that is something that I don't believe we have access to yet in New Mexico. So hopefully as we, you know, branch out and we meet other people, we can, we can continue to learn from each other. Um, so yes, $40 a year and it's, um, open to anybody who would like to be a member. So we will we will take anybody. Um, also too, this was the first time that NMTIA has included our ASL and CDI colleagues 
Um, and so thank you very much to our ASL interpreters. Um, thank you very much uh, for those of you who are attending and those who are actively signing for us. It is, um, it really is um, a dream come true to have this level of collaboration. So thank you. And yes, um, Esther, that is Penelope who just, I don't have children that will come up and touch my shoulder, but I do have cats who will jump and do a cat bomb in the meeting, so. <laughs> nice. Cool, thank you so much, Lisa. And yeah, I would echo that. Thank you to our wonderful interpreters. Uh, I'm so glad that we were able to be so inclusive and include our certified deaf interpreters um, and just any of, member of the deaf population, deaf community that would like to see this later. So hope you guys find benefit in it as well. I'm gonna hang out guys just for a few minutes. If there was something we didn't get to, uh, something that I just didn't answer, and I know there were a few things that I missed along the way, uh, would you please go ahead and, uh, recopy it, put it back in the chat box now. Let's talk about it uh, as well. I think at this point, you guys can voice uh, if you'd like to just take your uh, microphones and uh, activate your microphones and chat. That's fine as well. But I got a few minutes. So anything that you wanted to chat about, let's go ahead and do that. Josh, hey, I Josh. Okay, yeah, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Um, thank you, Josh. For This is Emmy. Thank you for the fruitful presentation. Uh, I had a question earlier that I can able to... Uh, type in. Yeah. Um, I mean, at the end of each interpreting assignment, I go like maybe excused like any other attorney uh, says to the judge. So I had a situation when I was formally excused and the LEP add something else. So am I at that point like able to not just interpret what it, whatever it was added from LEP since I was excused formally in the record by the judge? Thank you. So we're, make sure that I understand. So you asked to be excused and you were, were you still connected? You were still connected. And then after he said, yes, you're excused, the LEP said something else? Correct, yes. Hmm. Honestly, if I'm still on there, I think legally probably you wouldn't have any obligation, but if I'm still on there and I hear it, I would interpret it. I would facilitate that communication. Um, you know, Is there a legal requirement for you to do so at that point? Technically, you've been excused. Excused means probably you can end the call. I think if you're still there, if you can still hear it, uh, there's some court business that has to be done. I would go ahead and interpret that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, for sure. And you know, even the question about should I ask to be excused or not, I typically do that as well. Uh, but it 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 just depends. Pay attention to your context. Some judges are just busy, and you know you're done, and maybe you hang out a couple minutes and you disconnect. Other judges want you to be asked to be excused. So you sort of take that into consideration along the way. Ideally, you do do that, but maybe it's not always possible. Thank you again. Cool. Let me take a look here. So Mojgen, my good buddy from Mojgen says, in a remote case, the judge gave my phone number to the attorney and asked him to contact me separately in case he needs an interpreter to explain uh, to, the, to the LEP who is not present in the case. Uh, I know this is a conflict of interest, but wondering if the judges knows it. So, okay. In, in our state, in the state of Kentucky, does the judge know it? Yes, the judge does know it. They've had training and it's in our Supreme Court orders. Um, in other places, maybe not so much. They do know it and they shouldn't do that. So Mojgin, what I would do in that case, you should call us. If the judge gave out your private number, you should call us and we should address that with the judge. And I have no problem, been doing this a lot of years, I have no problem addressing these issues behind the scenes with a judge um, at this point. It's, it's not an issue on, on our side. Hopefully on New Mexico side, I know you guys are going through a management change as well. Um, and I know that they're looking for that, that statewide uh, manager position that just came open. I, I hope that there's somebody there as well who can, who can take on that, that role. But yeah, just call me. Nobody should be giving out your private number. That's not appropriate. Let's uh, see, what else guys? Joshua, I, I was trying to repeat my written question here, but there's such a long queue. I think if I can just verbalize yeah. it. Go ahead, Carlos. Uh, Hi, nice to meet you. Uh, there, there, there was a recent training I attended in which uh, some of the people from, uh, from Zoom and also uh, a Georgia uh, uh, remote, you know, the guy that's in charge of implementing this uh, for the Georgia state courts are talking about a, a trend towards uh, simultaneous interpreting in all cases, possibly because the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, one of the, one of the uh, contractors is actually a conference interpreting uh, na nationwide, uh, and, and that's the way they're used to looking at things for maximum efficiency. Uh, but uh, the, the reason that has traditionally been given for 
uh, consecutive interpreting uh, being mandatory, if, for instance, in defendant allocutions prior to sentencing, when the judge gives the opportunity for an interpreter uh, to, I mean, for a defendant to, to mm -hmm. uh, uh, say his, his piece. And uh, sometimes also witness to, uh, it hasn't occurred yet in trial, and pardon me for you know, making the question so long, but Zoom makes it uniquely possible for allocutions to be in simultaneous, particularly since the, uh, the voice, the original Spanish voice that some judges like to hear just to kind of like have that tactile confirmation that the interpreter is actually working for another person who's actually speaking. But simultaneous is a definite option. Have you seen that popping up anywhere? And, and how do you feel about it as far as, because consecutive, no matter how you know, meticulous you are, and some people have incredible storage capabilities, but there's always a higher margin of error, I believe, than there is in simultaneous, which is you know, straight you know, plugged in, in my view anyway. Uh, so I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Yeah, it's a very interesting question. And yes, uh, we've actually played with that a little bit here in Kentucky, like you're saying, with Zoom, you have the functionality. There's really no reason it doesn't work in that direction. Um, I am cautiously optimistic that it can work. The, the, there are several different reasons you know, why we might not do it simultaneously. There are some states that actually mandate that when the LEP speaks, it must be done in the consecutive mode. So be careful there. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily the case in Kentucky may not be the case in New Mexico. That is the case, however, on a federal level. Uh, federal mm -hmm. guidance would tell us that when the LEP speaks, it must be done in the consecutive mode. Now, that's not to say we can't vary a little bit, but be careful there. Also, and it's actually very interesting, it, there have been several studies that show if done well, and that's a key, done, done well, consecutive actually is more, um, it, it's actually more accurate, uh, quite a bit more accurate than simultaneous because you have more time to analyze the message process the content and then put it in the other direction. But having said that, you know, that's going to vary quite a bit. And, and I agree with you. For me, it's generally easier to do simul. We've used simul. Um, I've used simul in Kentucky to interpret for the LEP, for example, like in a domestic domestic violence hearing, when one of the LEPs has, has to give testimony about what happened. Um, and at some point, you know, you realize, hey, there's no reason you can't use simul. So it can work. I'm not opposed to it. Um, to it being done. It's done in conference interpreting a lot. I think court interpreting has never adopted that for other legal reasons, but am I completely opposed to it? No, just proceed with caution and also make sure that you know what, um, what your state requires when LEPs speak. Sometimes that's a legal matter, not an interpreting matter, but you know, am I open to it? Yeah, I mean, I'd be okay with that. I'd wanna know that it's done well. And on a practical um, level, I don't interpret as well simultaneously into English as I do into Spanish because I don't practice that way much. It does require a little bit of effort. It seems like it should be easy for me, but that's really is a little bit tough for me. So make sure that if you guys are going to do that, you practice in that direction. It doesn't just happen because English is your primary, right? Cool. Thank you. I, I was actually not aware of the federal um, no. uh, obligation to, to have the consecutive uh, from mm -hmm. LEP to the court. I was not aware of that. Thank you very much. I had a, a heated, a passionate conversation with an interpreter about that when I was in Miami uh, who wanted to provide simul and he did good simul that direction, but he couldn't do simul because the, the guide says that we can't. So yeah, careful there. What else? That's good, good to know. Rekha? I think you're on mute, Rekha. There you go. Yes, I just did. Sorry about that. I have two questions. One is on the form uh, for CEUs. It's asking for a membership number. So we don't have any membership number yet. So uh, sh what to write in that or would we still get the CEUs? Rekha, that's only if you are a RID certified interpreter, a sign language interpreter. Oh, okay. All right, thank you. And my other question is Joshua about that uh, personal phone number. Uh, lately, a couple of times it has happened that uh, we are asked to call the LEP on the phone as a second device and uh, don't have enough time to block the number. So is it okay to inform the judge and just, you know, of this complication and uh, request a couple of minutes to, un to block the number? Yeah, or for sure. Yes, okay. and I, I would always be concerned about giving out my personal information. Um, I'm not saying you can't do that. Maybe I have a comfort level with it and maybe you don't, but I think the interpreter always has the right to not give out the personal information. So yes, I, I would have no problem saying something like, your honor, um, the interpreter can do that. The interpreter didn't realize that she would need to actually call the, the LEP. Uh, could the interpreter have one moment just to 
configure my phone to make sure that my personal identifying information is protected. Yeah, just just be uh, upfront. Uh, you know, the bottom line is the judge would not want that person having his or her cell phone number either, right? So I think it's very understandable. So just be upfront, uh, very concisely say, yes, uh, judge, could, could the interpreter just have one moment to make the arrangements with my phone? I just want to protect my personal information. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, that's no problem. And, and keep in mind, judges are learning as well. They, they didn't consider that. They don't know, but it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Right, right, right. And on one occasion, actually, somebody other than myself had called with a blocked number and the LEP would not answer the pick up the phone because it was blocked. So can somebody be requested to inform them that, okay, you're going to be receiving a call or something like that? Yeah, yeah sure. The I, ideally, you know, ideally it would be upfront, right? Ideally it would be before because you would know, but yeah, you can. Uh, there's a good uh, comment by Hank, you know, leave a message and call back, sure. Uh, or the attorney potentially can call and let them know, hey, you're going to get a number from a blocked get a call from a blocked number, an right. unknown number, pick up the phone, it's the interpreter, okay, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, my friends. Excellent, well, excellent presentation. Thank you, it's so nice to, uh, to see you again, my friend. Annabelle, is that you, Annabelle? How are you, my friend? It's good to see you after all this time. Oh, I know, you trained me when I was very green. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see and you. Five years now, but... Um, before I became certified, I had, um, they put me in a separate room with the uh, LEP and the public defender to prep the, the, you know, the LEP. And then the public defender went on to say, well, let me practice my Spanish. Nice. And <laughs> I was kind of new and didn't know what to do. And, you know, it's like the attorney. So I just kind of like just shut down and it was disastrous. I mean, the, the guy was, I mean, trying, and, and then the LEP was like, afterward, you know, he went on to a little while, for a while, you know, and then they went, you know, and I think they were going to go in front of the judge, and, and the LEP was then like, idiot, you know, why, why did they assign me the public defender? Yeah. <laughs> it was just, I didn't know what to do. Yeah, that, that's a difficult situation. That's one of the reasons why I'm just, I'm very much against you know, interpreters have, having to be put in that situation, because really, you have no control over that attorney. You have no control over what that attorney wants to do. You know, what he was asking, I guess, is for him to do the, the most of it, and then you to be there as, you know, the backup in case he had questions or something. But then he never really used your, ser your services. In that case, what I would tell you, the attorney is responsible for the communication in and of itself. If you find yourself there and that's the way that the attorney wants to proceed, that's fine. You know, especially if he pulls you as the court interpreter and you're there, you know, really ethically, you can't comment on what he's saying, the content of what he's saying, you know, the validity of the interpretation it puts you in a really difficult situation. But what can you do in that situation? I would let it ride. I would let the attorney practice law the way the attorney feels that he or she needs to practice law. Uh, maybe after the conversation is over, as an aside, I might tell the attorney, you know, there were some concerns there, right? But I would just, I would just be very careful. I would just let the attorney practice law the way that he or she needs to. Um, and unfortunately, it's, it's really a bit unfair to put the court interpreter in that situation, because by, by definition, you, you can't interact, uh, you, you can't have an opinion, you can't, you know, assist, you can't advocate, right? So the, it's the attorney's role. If the attorney doesn't want to use your services, unfortunately, there's not much you can do. So it, it sounds like you did the right thing, but I wouldn't have a problem afterwards saying. Hey, counsel, I wanted to let you know, have, how do you say this? Um, you know, how, and how were you saying that before? Oh, yeah, maybe there's a little confusion. Have, have you thought about this? I'd be glad to assist next time. Maybe you pointed out some way. But yeah, I think you did the right thing. In, in that case, there, you, there's really no obligation. And even beyond that, there's an ethical limitation. You really can't have too much of an interaction in that way. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's why I have another question, unless somebody else has. I don't want to take anybody's turn. I think I think we're good. I'll see anybody else popping up. Do it, Rekha. Okay. So on another similar, I just got reminded of it. We were put in a breakout room with the defendant and the attorney. And there was another so-called interpreter or caseworker who was friendly with the defendant. And we were, I was interpreting, and every time I each time I interpreted the uh, caseworker or the friend was repeating the interpretation. So after a few sentences, I asked the attorney, is it okay if the, you know, if I asked, I mean, I didn't say I, if the interpreter makes sure that the LEP is understanding. 
And the LEP said yes. And then the other person tried to refrain themselves, but then still continue to do that. So what does what do you do in that situation? It's a strange situation. I've had similar things happen. You know, maybe I say something and then whoever's with the person will say the same thing, but you know, they explain it or they take it down and register. Um, I would address it with the judge. I would just address it with the judge. If you hear something else, you know, this other conversation or interpretation going forward, I would bring it to the judge's attention. Your Honor, the interpreter is hearing another voice speaking Spanish. Uh, apparently somebody is reinterpreting what the interpreter is saying after, after I interpret. I would let the judge know and I would ultimately let the judge deal with it. No, Joshua, this happened in the breakout room. Oh, breakout. Um, you know, <laughs> again, the, the issue is as a court proceeding, as the proceedings interpreter, you don't really have control over those people and there's no authority there to help you. So uh, were you there with another attorney? Was there an attorney there as well? Yeah, there was an attorney and I actually even asked the attorney, do you still need my interpreting services? And he said, oh yeah, 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 definitely. I requested an interpreter. So I did bring up the mm -hmm. issue with him briefly, but he said, oh, she's not an interpreter. She's just here to help. Yeah, I mean, if really that conversation and that interaction really should be done under the supervision of the attorney um, using the attorney's preferences. So if that attorney is is OK, uh, approves of whatever situation there is there. OK, that that's fine. That can happen. Uh, I think you brought up the concern to the attorney. So I think it's it's an unfortunate situation, but I don't think there's any anything that you can do, because really, this is not assigned as the court interpreter. You're not really court interpreting at that moment, you know, there's case preparation and that attorney can decide to do that in any number of ways. So I think it's fine if that's what the attorney wants to do. If you hear issues with the interpretation, I wouldn't have a problem bringing up to the attorney that the other interpreter is perhaps adding confusion or perhaps not interpreting correctly. You could say that, but in the end, it's the attorney's really within the attorney's purview to do that interaction the way that he or she wants. So I don't think there's much to do there other than just make that that known initially. Yes, there was additions and that I did bring right. it to the attorney's attention, I guess. So that yeah, I, as long as you did that, I think that you're covered. Uh, okay. You know, I would try try not to get into that situation as the court interpreter where I have to do that. I know that's not a, avoidable sometimes, but sounds like you did the right thing. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, my friend. Good to see you. you too, Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, that is what I've got. Um, you're going to have my contact information, feel free to reach out to me. Give me a few days to get back to you, but reach out and uh, we can chat about whatever you want. I wish you all the very, very best. Um, hard times, weird, weird situation to live through. I hope you and yours are well on a personal level. Um, I know that interpreters have suffered a lot because there's not in-person court. I hope that this training helps you. Uh, and I just really want to encourage you, whatever it is you're going through, uh, professionally or privately, if you get knocked back down, I want you to get back up. All right, get back up get back to it. Good things are going to happen. This is a new year, and I know that good stuff is coming, so stay with it. Stay focused, stay positive, and um, I know that good things are coming. That's all I got. Lisa, thank you so much, my friend. Thank you very much, Josh, and again, I hope this is just the first of many uh, collaborations that we can have with uh, Kentucky in the future. This really was wonderful. Thank you. All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and end the session. If you do um, have any trouble receiving your certificates, please uh, reach out to an MTIA and we will do our best to get it resolved. And again, thank you very much to our ASL interpreters, Marva, Leah, you're wonderful. So thank you guys. And I hope everybody has a wonderful rest of the day and a glorious weekend. Bye-bye.